Hey, John, it's Chuck. Um, hey, Chuck. Your call. We definitely have a quorum. I think we're just right. tracking down two members at this point. Yeah, I know. I saw Catherine Phillips on the list, but now she's gone. So. Yeah, I don't see her yet. As soon as I see her, I'll move her over to panelists okay. or Alexa will. And All right. Well, let's get started since we do have a quorum. Uh, so, Chuck, do you want to kick it off or do you want me to kick it off? I just say welcome, everybody. Yet another great Wildlife Conservation Board meeting where we're going to do fantastic things for California. John, over to you. Great. Thank you, Chuck. And yes, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending the November 18th, 2021 WCB meeting. So just the little logistics for meeting uh, etiquette and that kind of thing. I'll go over, I'll, first I'll do the roll call, make sure we establish a quorum, and then I'll go over meeting logistics, and then we'll get into the, the meat of the agenda. So once again, welcome everyone. Uh, so with the roll call, uh, Chuck Bonham. I am here. Uh, Gail Miller. For Department of Finance. Pete Silva, Fishing Game Commissioner. I'm here. I'm here. Alina Bokde. I'm here. Damon Nagami. I'm here. Fran Pavley. Here. Catherine Phillips. Here. Great. And then from the legislative advisory uh, roll call side, uh, for Senator Borges, Megan D'Souza. Here. For Senator Stern, Catherine Moore. Here. For Senator Skinner, Katrina Robinson. Uh, for Assembly Member Garcia, Keith Chilino. Here. For Member Rivas, Natalie Turan. Here. And from Assembly Member Bennett's office, Alex Soto. And then before we get into the agenda, I just would like to welcome both Natalie and Alex, representing Assembly Member Rivas and Bennett, respectively. Uh, the two Assembly Members are new appointees to the Legislative Advisory Committee of the Wildlife Conservation Board, so I do want to welcome them. Looking forward to working with you and your, your boss going forward. So uh, just once again, welcome. And with that, I will go over some meeting logistics. Uh, as you can see and experience, we are, the meeting is being conducted via Zoom. Uh, for those using a telephone system only, you can access the presentation that will be presented throughout the meeting by going to the Wildlife Conservation Board website and pull down the presentation from the meetings tab. If you are using a phone system, you need to press zero or star six to unmute and mute yourself. And then also during public comments, I would like to ask that you use the raise hand function on the phone, which can be found at the bottom of your screen or by, if you're on the phone, but you can press star nine to raise and lower your hand. The format of the meeting uh, taking place today will complete the first few agenda items one through four and then proceed to the consent calendar items. And I will take, we will take comments and questions uh, from the board members, if any, and then take public comment on the subsequent consent calendar. And then I will read the motion into the record and then we'll have a roll call vote for the consent. Then we'll move on to the presentation or the discussion calendar. I will introduce the project and then as before, we, I used to read into the record letters of support that we've received. We've changed that so we could kind of reduce the time in which it takes to read the several letters of support that each project usually gets. And if you look in the agenda, you can see the letters that we've received for both support and opposition. So I won't be reading any letters into the record today unless there's one that came subsequent to the agenda going out. At the end of the presentation, I will ask for board member comments and questions and then ask for public comments. If however, a board member has any question or needs clarification during a specific presentation, please raise your hand or speak up and we'll be happy to address that concern or question at that time. For public comments, for any member of the public making comments, please state your name and your affiliation. 
The order of the public comment will be as follows. Those who filled out speaker cards in advance of the meeting and those requesting to speak using the hand, raise hand function. And I will finally ask if there's any comments outside of those two areas, if anybody wishes to speak. And then public speakers will be limited uh, to three minutes. So I would ask that you take that into consideration and keep within that time frame. Similarly, and lastly, like past board meetings, I would like to ask the board if they're comfortable holding off with individual motions for each project. If so, I will have one motion for the consent calendar and then one motion for all projects presented. However, if any board member wishes to condition the approval of a project or would prefer to have a roll call vote for any particular item, I will call for the motion, complete a roll call vote, and then move on to the next project. So with that, is there any questions from the board members before we get into the agenda? Great, seeing none, we'll move on to item number two in the agenda. This provides an opportunity for the public to make a comment for issues, items that are not in the uh, agenda today. So is there any public wishing to make any comments at this time? Please raise your hand. All right, seeing no hands raised. Um, John, there are four, five hands raised. Do you want me to call them out and yeah, okay so conrad fisher and i'll allow you to talk there you go okay am i off mute yes hi um yeah i just uh conrad fisher with water climate trust and i'm in on some level following up on um report i helped release in 2016 called measuring cost effectiveness of environmental water transactions and also thanking staff for their response since the last meeting about this topic. Um, and I just wanted to say, I think um, given the responses, I, I wanted to try to explain this in a simpler terms. I mean, when you look at the report, it looks complicated, but at the most base level, what we are asking of the board is that they collect the data necessary to ensure that stream flow enhancement fund projects, number one, do not reduce stream flows. So I know Mrs. Pavley and others were very familiar with the legislative intent. The intent was to enhance stream flows in, in different ways. Um, and our fear is that by investing in water diversion infrastructure improvements without requiring that the conserved water is dedicated in stream, fish will get less water. So that is first, number one, first do no harm. And then the next would be to collect the data necessary to also make the best decisions on maximizing cost effectiveness. So first do, do no harm and then maximize cost effectiveness. And we have submitted what we call fish flow funding principles, which I can resubmit on how to accomplish that. So that is our ask again. Um, and then I, I asked staff, can you retroactively look at past projects? Um, and it does not appear for the Scott Shasta River, at least we can do that based on actual water in the actual river. But I guess my question is, Nonetheless, we should have, we are hoping that we can have point by point data from applicants that says what they are at least claiming. For example, are you claiming how many CFS for how many months for how many river miles those basic basic facts. Um, we would really encourage the wildlife conservation board to require that applicants put at the very top of the proposal so the public can comment on them and so it's easier for board members to know what is being claimed. Um, so. All of the, the recommendations for fish flow funders are in a document related to that report, and I'm happy to answer any questions individually now at any time, but I really hope this can start happening. Thank you. Great, thank you, Conrad. Next one, Celeste. Um, Doug Obegi. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Board Members. My name is Doug Obiji. I'm a Senior Attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC, and I'm speaking today to follow up on a letter that we, along with the Coalition of Conservation and Fishing Groups, sent to the Board on October 20th regarding the criteria and guidelines for the $100 million in SB 170 that is dedicated to the Board's Streamflow Enhancement Program. And in our letter, we, uh, we recognize that the draft criteria and guidelines are not out yet, uh, but we wanted to provide input early because we believe that um, it is essential to get this program right. 
And we believe that the most recent solicitation provides a, a good framework for um, the, the next round of solicitation, but we wanted to highlight four key principles that we believe are necessary and appropriate. The, the first is that these funds must be used to generate new environmental flows and can't be used to subsidize existing mitigation or compliance obligations. The second is that projects should really be evaluated primarily on the basis of the magnitude of benefits for fish and wildlife. Um, so we're really getting the biggest bang for the buck. Um, the third is that we want to see durable investments in environmental flows as a priority, um, particularly permanent and long-term acquisitions over short-term transfers. And last, that projects that directly benefit and are supported by disadvantaged communities should be prioritized. And just to go briefly into a little more detail on each of those principles, on the first one, the law is very clear that we need to have, um, you can't use these funds for existing obligations imposed on any party under law. Um, so this is, you know, this was include state water quality standards, Endangered Species Act protections, minimum flows. It really is about improving flows compared to the regulatory baseline. And we encourage the board to give substantial priority to, to projects that propose to dedicate in-stream flows under Section 1707C of the Water Code, because those provide benefits in perpetuity above the regulatory baseline. Second, we continue to believe that projects should be evaluated based on the magnitude of the net environmental benefits. While the law requires that the board give some consideration for a preference for projects that enhance delta outflows, that is not a uh, criteria requirement, it is simply a preference. And we're very concerned that um, focusing exclusively on that would yield small, particularly given the magnitude of delta outflow needs, um, and the fact that those standards are being updated through regulatory processes, that it would not be cost effective and that we should really be focused on things like uh, smaller coastal streams, headwater streams, places where smaller increases in flow will have a relatively large bang for the buck. Third, um, we believe that we, the board should prioritize permanent and long-term acquisitions, um, which is consistent with the approach that the board has taken over many years, including in the Prop 1 from several years ago. And then lastly, that it is really essential to work with disadvantaged communities and tribes to not just build support, but ensure that these programs benefit those disadvantaged communities as well. Um, we will be continuing to work with uh, board staff. Um, we're encouraged by the openness to meeting with us and really appreciate you taking the time to consider these comments. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Doug. Next one. Um, Nick Jocelyn. Hi, my name is Nick Jocelyn. I work at the Mount Shasta Bioregional Ecology Center. I'd like to thank you for the work you guys do. I believe that you are responsible for funding some important and successful projects. And I wanna speak just uh, directly about projects within the Shasta River Valley. My family settled there in the mid 1800s. <clears throat> I'm the fifth generation to grow up in the area. And um, I have, uh, my comments really kind of pertain similarly to uh, Doug's comment about the stream flow enhancement funds. And uh, particularly out there, seeing some of the irrigation efficiency projects that um, really haven't reduced water use. And uh, as an NGO, it's actually even pretty hard to verify that because there's a, a lack of publicly available monitoring equipment. So we sort of have to dig around and figure out whether these projects actually did enhance flow. One thing we've looked at is 1707 in-stream dedication permits, and there really aren't any issues out there, which um, really ultimately speaks to the fact that they aren't reducing consumptive use when they get new irrigation equipment. Um, the other thing is there's basically no supervisory agency that makes sure that um, the project actually implements the type of irrigation efficiencies that they're speaking of. And some of that has to do with center pivots, drop irrigation, size of nozzles. You know, everybody is afraid to meter a well for groundwater use, but um, there really is no way to tell if somebody is using less water 
because they can remove the water more easily. And so, uh, it, it, um, as I scrolled down in the agenda before the meeting, I had noticed some of your strategic uh, planning ideas. And I noticed a couple of them that I think I, I could really get behind. And um, one of them was SI8, objective SI8.1 by 2021, define criteria for effectiveness monitoring by program, habitat, or geography. Sounds, sounds great. I think we've been here asking a similar thing of you guys for about the last year now. Um, also goal A, in environmental protection and conservation, A5, improve transparency and efficiency of WCB and CDF and W project evaluation and recommendations to approve or deny applications. So improving the transparency is something that we also believe should be done. Uh, some of these projects, the uh, public doesn't get to see until they're nearly approved. And so that's been problematic when trying to decide whether we can get behind a project or not, because we aren't really actually seeing the project until it's essentially about to be funded. And um, so it's, um, that's what's making it tough for the public. And uh, I thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Nick. Next, Celeste. And please remember folks to limit your comments to three minutes. We do have a timer going now, so we'll be, I hate to do it, but we'll have to cut you off if you go past three minutes. So next. Um, Michael um, Steidelman, Mayor. Michael, you should be able to unmute. You're on mute right now. Go to the next one, Celeste, and we'll come back to you. Um, OK, David Webb. David Webb doesn't seem to be muted. Michael, are you uh, on and have you been able to unmute yourself? It's not allowing me to unmute him. Last, I can share that he has a black screen and may be having some trouble. We can carry it on after consent if needed. Okay, let's do that. So David and Michael will come back to you. Uh, so that's, let's move on to item number three in the agenda. Unless there's any other public comment, I don't see any. Oh, there's one panelist hand up. Yeah, it's, it's me. Um, I just wanted to thank the, the folks who uh, spoke out from the public for um, making uh, their comments. But I also wondered, and this might come up in your report, so if I'm early, just tell me, Joan, it'll come up. Um, in reference to what Doug was raising, it made me wonder again, when do we anticipate that that uh, draft criteria will be available for the public to view? Yeah, we're hoping at the next board meeting, uh, we're, we're currently working on that now. I was going to briefly talk about it in the funding status. I'm going to go over the specific amounts that we received through the general fund. But yeah, we're hoping uh, at the very earliest, it'll be February or perhaps May. Uh, we'll get the guidelines and the criteria and that kind of thing. We're currently working with folks now on that. We have some meetings scheduled as uh, one of the speakers had indicated so we'll be having holding those meetings in december and january we are engaging the department of fish and wildlife and department of water resources as well so we're working through uh the guidelines and uh you know we're really taking a close look at the current stream flow guidelines and then see how we uh 
mo modify those to fully implement the new general fund money. So uh, hopefully after the first of the year, we'll have, have them pretty well wrapped up and hopefully out uh, for public review, your review. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Damon? Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, I also wanna thank the commenters for uh, speaking out. We really appreciate it. Um, just following up on that, uh, uh, when you're looking at stream, the Streamflow program, uh, I was curious if uh, WCB or the department had uh, metrics that they look at to determine if the, you know, a Streamflow enhancement project is effective or working kind of along the lines of the comments. Um, just as a new member would like to, you know, uh, understand that. And if there's not time right now, you know, if there are resources that could be made available to, you know, to um, maybe me and Catherine as newer members be okay. great. All right. Yeah. I mean, we currently are working on those. Also, we're working on a five-year report that hopefully will be out uh, in February as well for you guys, the board members. And then that'll kind of explain where we are. There's been a lot of work, a lot of planning projects, a lot of technical assistance type projects that we've funded through the Streamflow that will help us monitor and set metrics and those kinds of things uh, going forward. So. Uh, we can have a more in-depth conversation as well. Damon. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Any other board member comments? All right. Seeing that. So we'll move on to item number three. This is the funding status. This gives really a snapshot of all of the funds that are available now to the Wildlife Conservation Board. Uh, there are several different funding sources. We're still operating with several uh, bond sources, Prop 12, Prop 40, Prop 84, Prop 50, Prop 1, Proposition 68. Uh, and so I'd be happy to answer any specific greenhouse gas reduction funding uh, also. And then there's one that uh, it's a general fund, and I'll go into that right now. Uh, so Celeste, if you could put the thing up. So over this past summer and during the budget process, this past 21, 22 budget process, the legislature and the administration worked on several packages, climate package, drought package, and WCB was a recipient of some general fund money in really two categories. One in uh, climate or drought for drought support and uh, also for climate. Um, let me pull up my notes here. So the first was uh, $96 million. Uh, if you can go up just a little bit, Celeste, please. Um, on the screen itself, <clears throat> I can't move that. It should be. Okay, so we got a total of 96 million. It's one line that's not on there, but 96. And then we can use up to 5% of that allocation for uh, administrative costs to the program. And uh, you can see taking out the administrative amounts, we have a total of 91 million two hundred thousand dollars that's available for local assistance types projects and in within that allocation there was a 12.5 million dollar call out for a dam removal project down in southern california in cooperation and in connection with uh, department of parks and recreation so we have we are work currently working with parks on that project uh there's an additional 52 million that's available for drought impacts and I do want to point out that of that amount, we had allocated a $6 million grant to the Department of Fish and Wildlife at our last board meeting to really start implementing immediately drought impacts uh, on the landscape. And then that leaves a balance of uh, 25.971 for climate uh, restoration, invasive plant species habitat, wildlife corridor connectivity, and 30 by 30 goals. Uh, we also took action using that funding for a major wildlife overcrossing down uh, across Highway 101, known as the Annenberg Wildlife, Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Overcrossing. 
And if you recall, that was pre presented and approved at our last board meeting for a $20 million grant. The next allocation in the general fund money was uh, also for local assistance. And it was a $100 million amount for environmental flows. And this is what Conrad and others had been talking about. But then also, there's also uh, um, budget control language in there that it can also go for just our general authorities under the law of 1947, uh, which includes you know, our, our standard uh, restoration and enhancement program and then acquisition program. But then also it's the enhanced stream flow, acquisition of water rights, short and long-term transfer or leases, and then water for fish and wildlife. And also to improve aquatic riparian resources, and then it does say that priority to shall be given to projects that enhance delta outflow, but it doesn't necessarily we have to do that on every project. So that 100 million less administrative uh, amount is $95 million in which to do projects. There were also three additional uh, member requests as part of the AB 170, which was the trailer bill that was passed. And there was an, a, a million dollar West Coyote Hills allocation, and that was for appraisal services. So you'll be hearing about a West Coyote Hills project later today. This is to implement a phase two project if the landowner is willing and wanting to go forward. The next is a $750,000 grant to the city of Lake Elsinore uh, for a water project and aquatic restoration. We will be bringing that project forward in February for the allocation of that grant. And then lastly, the Lone Pine Ranch acquisition is a $10 million grant. Lone Pine Ranch is situated on the Eel River. And if you'll recall, we did the phase one project back in August, and this is to complete uh, all of the acquisition work necessary to completely acquire in fee and hold uh, by the Wildlands Conservancy on the Lone Pine Ranch. So uh, that kind of outlines our new general fund money that we received in this budget cycle. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions on that or any of the other funding amounts or status of the funding on any of the other uh, amounts in the, in the agenda. Alina? Um, thanks, John, for that report. Um, I just had a question. How do you envision implementing the goals of 30 by 30 into the climate uh, bucket that, of funding? Um, I know that there's a report that's coming out uh, early next year, but so can you talk about how you're seeing, how you, how you see that getting kind of embedded uh, in the way that staff will review projects or proposals. Yeah, I think we kind of already do that, Alina, because if our strategic plan was really based on you, the goals that I think that we're gonna be seeing coming out of the 30 by 30 goals. So a lot of the work that we're already doing is meeting a lot of the, we, we feel, and you know we've been talking with the agency, we feel that many of our projects are meeting those 30 by 30 goals. We are reporting up, we are meeting with agency and others on, on the plan, we're looking forward for that plan to come out and then we can start aligning specific strategic plan uh, goals and objectives with the 30 by 30 goals. And then we can really concentrate on the overlaps. And I think that's where we're gonna really see an impact. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's great that there's already a lot of alignment. I think in the analysis of the, the uh, recommendation letters that come to the board. I mean, it would be good to be able to develop that narrative of how it is addressing the 30 by 30 and some of the, and the framework that's coming out right, um, right. under the 30 by 30. So, so it, it kind of expands or where you find that overlap with the strategic plan goals. But I, you know, cause I do think there's, there's going to be some exciting work coming out of that um, that uh, I think will provide an additional lens to thinking about, you know, um, uh, projects that are funded under that framework. So, um, so look forward to that, but thank you for yeah. your insight. I'm really glad that it's almost 
ready to come out and be implemented. I'm hearing that by February, the plan should be done. So hopefully by that time frame, uh, you know, we will, we've would have already hit the ground running, uh, but then really be able to articulate more appropriately how we are meeting the goals that have been approved under the 30 by 30 plan. So, so Fran? Just for a point of clarification, and thank you for this uh, overview, um, under the first part on drought impacts, uh, maybe a short definition of what that is. Is that consistent with some of the project you listed under local assistance, or is it more fire resiliency and defensible space and taking out dead trees and things like that? It's uh, not so much the latter. Uh, it's more of a mean, it's more related to water wetlands, those kinds of things. But, you know, and then it could be, I mean, it doesn't preclude us from doing forest resiliency type projects, uh, you know, as a result from the drought. So I think it's a combination. It, it provides us the flexibility to look at all of that. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's why I wondered with the general fund connection, whether that was, or whether there's another agency that it also goes into that space. Cause I always think of us. Uh, historically being in more of the uh, restoration uh, category and increasing water and watersheds and water quality, et cetera, and um, protecting habitat. So um, I was just curious because that, that uh, I remember when the language was written, it was sort of um, broad and was sort of yet to be determined. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on this together with you. All right, yes. Catherine? Thanks for that question, Fran. Um, I didn't even know I had it too, but when you asked it. <laughs> um, John, I'm, I'm looking at the deadlines. Uh, for instance, all of this has to be expended by June of 2024. And I'm wondering if you can explain to us a little more about how that timing works in terms of what expended means and then when, when do the projects have to be done? And as an aside, you know, I've been talking to people who are involved in restoration and that sort of thing. And I know that one of the general concerns is that the time, the timelines, which are often dictated by um, the, the, the constraints that the legislature will put on some funding, the timelines are so rapid that it's hard sometimes to do things in restoration that might, for instance, in my favorite subject, that might avoid using certain herbicides and using other approaches because things have to happen fast to accommodate um, deadlines set by the legislature. Can you talk a little bit about what those deadlines and how that works? Yeah, that, yeah, thanks for the question, Catherine. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that we really look at initially on a, on a project, whether or not we can fund it, because you know it puts a lot of pressure on our grantees to get a project done within the timeframe that the funding is going to be available. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's typically always budget control language that identifies the length that the funding is going to be good for. It's typically, you know, on, on a lot of bond resources, it's usually a five-year expenditure. You have five years to, in which to spend the funds you usually have three years in which to encumber. And encumber means that we gotta find a project, develop a project, get it to the board, get it approved. And then you have three years plus two years in which to implement the project if, that, if it's done in the first year. But when you have a project that backs up into the third year and you fund it that third year out, then you only have three years, you have that current year plus an additional two in which to in which to uh, fund the project. However, you you know there oftentimes we go back for reappropriations, and if you've seen, if you follow the budget process, oftentimes you'll see in in the governor's budget uh, proposed budget where WCB is requesting for a reappropriation of a certain amount of funding, and if it's reappropriated, that will allow us to continue and carry on those those monies. But you know in order. But to fund a project without the assurances that that reappropriation will actually happen, it's, it's hard for us to do. 
So we got to make sure that the project is done within the time frame of the funding that the funding is good for. So it does put a constraint on projects. It does limit the amount of time a grantee has to complete and do the project. Uh, and that's something that we're always following. And you know, we've seen it's even uh, become even more of a concern in coming into COVID because so many projects have been extended just because of the, the work hasn't been able to get done for a variety of reasons. But we've had to we've had to extend several of our grants. Fortunately, the money is is good uh, through the extension period. But I can't I can't extend a grant past the uh, uh, liquidation period of the particular line item in the budget. Uh, so I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, you know, we have, as of late, many of the bond resources that we get, as well as other funding is uh, appropriated through the legislative process. Some of the early bond uh, programs that we operated, the funding was continuously appropriated. And that really provided WCB the flexibility to carry projects forward, consider longer, because the money doesn't have to go back for reappropriation. It just continues on until it's spent. So uh, we don't see that too much anymore, but uh, you know, I don't know how they will look at that going forward. So I hope that helps. I mean, so that it, it sounds to me like the early money you have more flexibility on and that might be, that would better accommodate doing some of the kinds of work that you have to do through restoration. It just seems that certain kinds of restoration work takes a lot of time and a lot of monitoring and a lot of going back and um, uh, at doing additional work to make sure the first part of the work um, uh, succeeded. Okay. Fran, did you have another question? No, I don't. Okay. I better yeah. press lower hand. Thank you. All right. Any other board member questions? All right. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to item number four in the agenda. This is the ex director's report. And I just have a couple quick uh, items. For, for you. And one is the legislative process this year that affect WCB. Uh, and I think we have a slide for this, right, Celeste? There we go. So there were really five pieces of legislation this year that affects WCB, I think positively in all of it. The first was a trailer bill, trailer bill, it's a transportation trailer bill, trailer bill 149. Uh, it was a transportation trailer bill, and it provides WCB the uh, opportunity and actually provides the support we need to be in uh, to name wildlife overcrossings uh, that we have funded and or have working on along the state. Uh, the, the, it's a very sm small piece of legislation, but it defines what non-vehicular wildlife crossings are. And just real quickly, uh, non-vehicular wildlife crossing means a structure that allows animals to cross human-made barriers safely and includes, but not limited to, underpasses, tunnels, viaducts, overpasses, amphibian tunnels, fish ladders, and culverts. So I think this is a great thing. It also says that we can name the crossing of at least 25% of the funding to construct is derived from a state source. And then it also requires us to consult with Caltrans on the lettering, the type of lettering that's being used and uh, you know, the placement of the lettering on, on the structure itself. And then we may adopt criteria for implementation. We will be looking to put together some, uh, some guidelines for, in, for us to, to use and let folks know about. And I think probably the first one that you guys actually named or uh, recognized was the Wallace Annenberg. You guys took action. It was named that in the agenda last time, the Wallace Annenberg overcrossing. So that 
Uh, it'll be projects like that or under crossings that we uh, bring forward to the board. The next piece of legislation was uh, AB 379, and that uh, amended uh, the Fish and Game Code to allow the Wildlife Conservation Board and the department to enter into agreements and make grants to uh, California Native American tribes. It, WCB didn't have that authority up until this legislation uh, because it wasn't a recognized uh, approved grantee in the Fish and Game Code. So now California Native American tribes are a, uh, an appropriate entity in which we can make grants to. The next piece of legislation was AB 1183. This was a pretty big bill, it was uh, introduced by Ramos. Uh, it creates or establishes the California Desert Conservation Program at the Wildlife Conservation Board. So beginning January 1st of 2022, we'll be implementing a new program uh, down in the Mojave and Colorado deserts. The goals of the, the program will be to protect, preserve and restore the natural and cultural and physical resources of the, the portions of the Mojave and Colorado deserts within the desert region in California. It exempts out, however, the designated boundary of the Coachella Valley Mountains Conservancy, but we'll be working closely with that organization. And I am a board member on the, on the conservancy, so there'll be a lot of overlap coordination. It also, uh, we will promote the protection and restoration of the biological diversity of the region. Uh, we're to provide resilience in the region to climate change protect and improve air quality and res water resources within the region, and then also enhance public use and enjoyment. Uh, and then also one important thing in order to implement and carry out the program, uh, it also establishes the California Desert Conservation Fund account. We didn't see any money for that account this year, but hopefully next year we'll be able to see some funding in that account, which will enable us to uh, implement the program going forward. Uh, and then the last piece of legislation was AB 1219. This was a bill by Berman to extend the Natural Heritage Preservation Tax Credit Act uh, of 2000. It's been on the books since two, 2000. We've had it extended, the time extended, I think three times now. So the uh, folks can qualify for a tax credit project through June 30th of 2026. And what the program really does is allows the WCB to authorize a tax credit up to 55% of the fair market value of the uh, acquisition. And then the landowner or the seller can take claim that as a net tax credit off his California tax obligation. And then uh, also carry that credit forward and use a portion or all of it for a 15 year period. So it's, it's a pretty attractive uh, opportunity if you're in that position in order to take advantage of it. The other thing we have to do is that we have to reimburse the general fund, however. So we have to find, if it's a 55% credit, we do have to find uh, the money necessary to backfill the general fund. And so a lot of our partners have helped us on projects, WCB's contributed, we can use local money, private philanthropy money, federal money. And then we, we take that money in and we put it in the tax credit account. And then it, the, the general fund is reimbursed as those credits are rolled out. So that's the legislation uh, that affected WCB this legislative session. All of the, obviously all of the bills were signed by the governor and uh, we're happy that they were. So any questions on that particular one? Damon? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, agree that that's terrific legislation on the, um, uh, you know, giving the ability to tribes to accept grants. That seems like something that is long overdue. So just uh, gratitude to the legislature. Um, just wondering if you could speak a little bit to, um, or are there gonna be uh, efforts on behalf of staff to, reach out actively to tribes to get the word out that this is now available. Seems like um, a natural thing to do. Yes, we plan on doing that. Uh, Rebecca Friss, our assistant executive director here at the WCB, she's actually our liaison coordinator with tribal liaison coordinator. So we're happy, we're starting to roll that out. 
And then also, you know, we do notify the tribes uh, of all of our board meetings of all of the projects on our agenda. So we can, we'll continue to do that, but we'll engage tribal uh, groups more directly now going forward. Thank you. Catherine? Yeah, John, I, I missed it. You may have said it, but this uh, California Desert Conservation Fund account, has any funding been put into that by the legislature or is it just the fund set up for future? It is, yeah, it's not, it hasn't received any funding yet. The accounts still need to be set up. And so the, the legislation just passed, it becomes effective January 1st. So it goes into effect January 1 of 2022. So this gives you time um, to establish this desert conservation program? It does. Um, and what do you have any sense yet about what that process will be or are you you all just sort of starting to figure it out we're just okay. starting to figure it out got it and you'll be coming back and reporting to us then i will you. yeah okay great well this looks like a really exciting opportunity and i'm i mean i'm really excited that the the desert's getting the attention it deserves great. thanks all right any other questions I had a question, John. Yeah, Fran. Yeah. Um, where would I find um, a little more detailed information on the Berman bill and that's the extension of that uh, tax credit if I wanted to read more about it? I know I, I understand the basic concept, but um, some of the backfill and other provisions, where would I find that? Is that something that WCB staff Yeah, would have? we actually have program guidelines on our website. Oh, perfect. Uh, you know, so that's all I need to know. There. Yeah. And then I can send you a copy of the legislation if you'd like as well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions? All right. And just quickly, the last thing on uh, just to report on uh, WCB has moved to the new Re California Natural Resources Building. Uh, we moved shortly after our last meeting in August. Uh, however, staff are still. Uh, teleworking, we, were, we are going to implement a hybrid telework policy after the first of the year. So that's just been, it's just great to be in a new building and hopefully, you know, February, I don't know about February, but no later than May, hopefully we can have a WCB meeting in the new Natural Resource Agency auditorium. It's a beautiful room, uh, very accommodating, recepting. So Hopefully we'll be there in either February or May. Uh, but you know, I anticipate and I do plan on continuing some kind of public hybrid board meeting. So I don't know how all that's going to work yet, but we're still working through that. I think a lot of organizations are in the same boat. How do we do a in-person plus a Zoom uh, public meeting? So we're working through those logistics now and thinking about that but it's you know, we were hoping to be in the new audit in the new auditorium for this board meeting but those plans had changed and so we had to go to a all zoom type meeting all right so if you guys ever get to sacramento or want to tour the building just let me know and i'd be happy to show you around uh it's a beautiful building so with that unless there's any questions we'll move on to a consent calendar. All right, Fran, your hand's still up. Is that just a legacy hand? No, it isn't. I thought it said lower hand. Oh. Okay. All right. And John, we do have the two folks that we didn't get on public comment that are back if you when you want to. Okay. All right. Yeah, let's just go real quick to David Webb. This is for public comment that's for items not on the agenda. David? Uh, thank you, Mr. Donnelly. And I'm sorry the power outage up here has cut some of us off. Uh, I want to thank the, the Wildlife Conservation Board. You funded some magnificent projects over the years. Uh, and I don't know where we'd be without you. Uh, but today, I wanted to, to give a little background on myself. I am a member of the Friends of the Shasta River. I've spoken to some of you before. Um, I worked for 25 years on fisheries and water quality restoration work in the Shasta River only. I chose to focus on it and so came to know a great, great deal about uh, the river, the local communities, the land, the land uses, everything I could about the Shasta Valley. And 
since I retired uh, some years later, I and several friends formed Sh Friends of the Shasta River to try to sort of fill in where persons working on it for pay couldn't go, couldn't do. And one of the things we've, we've noticed is that it is all too easy for a project proponent to fail to mention the potential downsides of a project, to fail to mention all the aspects of the project, to basically do their best to pull the wool over a potential funder's eyes to make sure they do get funded without necessarily meeting the goals and intent of the funding. And it's, it's, it's become worrisome that two out of the last three projects for the Shasta Valley, we had to raise issues on one, the Novi Ranch from two years ago, uh, where we pointed out the fact that they were basing the request for $3.3 million in improvements to the irrigation system, much of which was based on illegal use of a riparian water right, where the, well, the Water Resources Control Board has now filed with them a notice of violation and is proceeding to, to curtail that, that diversion. Had we not raised those issues, that, that project had been recommended for funding and the money would have been spent by now before any action could have been taken. And then last year, the Grenada Irrigation District that was apparently quite comfortable to stretch the truth an awful lot in their application for $6 million for a pipeline. There's no way that your staff could have uncovered the details that needed to be uncovered to put these projects into proper perspective. How anyone not locally involved, locally knowledgeable could possibly hope to do that I, I don't understand, but somehow we need to add to your process some sort of a devil's advocate program so that when a, a project proponent brings something forward with all the good parts laid out and none of the bad, there's someone else that can enlighten you all so that you can protect the public's funds and make sure the money is well spent and gets the proper results, which otherwise, at least in some cases, doesn't seem to happen. Now, I don't think it's the majority of your projects, but on some, it can be significant and it's very worrisome to me for both the individual projects and also future funding uh, if, if knowledge of, of such problems came out. So thank you very much. And I would love to speak with you further in detail if there's an opportunity. I think it's something the board really needs to have some sort of a workshop on, perhaps with staff. Thank you. Great, thank you, David. And Michael Stettelmeyer. Steidelmeyer. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, my name is Michael Steidelmeyer. I'm a local farmer in Colusa County. And um, my property is adjacent to the Boger Ranch donation proposal. And my concern is, or I'm addressing the board, see if they would consider upon a, when they if they approve the project or approve the, the the property that i could they would consider having a buffer zone on the southern border southern and eastern border my concern is this i have an orchard right on that on the line and during deer season there you know i have crew working in that orchard and i'm just nervous about you know the public being in there with firearms that close to the property line. And also on the southern, southeastern corner, I have a building and a residence less than 50 yards from the property corner. So I was just would like to see if the if they approve the project, if the board would consider, you know, creating a buffer zone on the southern southeastern corner, you know, beyond 150 yards, you know, as the the laws read for discharging a firearm near a residence. Hey, John, this yes. is Chuck as chair. And I, my sense is um, Mr. Stadelmeyer is commenting about potentially a specific agenda item that's yeah. ahead of us. Yeah, that's that, that's ahead of us. Okay, so Mr. Stadelmeyer, why don't you keep my track of the, the agenda? That's okay. The, the Zoom platform you know, facilitates all of us having these confused moments. And just be sure yeah. <laughs> um, we'll, to raise your hand when we get to that specific agenda item later in the meeting. Okay, I apologize. Yeah, no worries. This is my first no Zoom meeting. <laughs> uh, lucky you. And <laughs> on that front, 
Um, <laughs> just mindful, it's two o'clock. So we've got consent to get through and non-consent, all of which are at the project level. John, how do you wanna proceed? Yeah, well, we're at the, the consent calendar right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, is, I would ask for a motion on the consent calendar unless there's any concerns or questions from board members on the consent calendar item. Catherine? Move approval of the consent calendar. Yeah, John, I'd like to um, take item 24 and 25 off of consent and put it into the discussion of projects. Okay, we can do that. So, uh, okay. Catherine, this is Chuck. Would you be willing to move five through 21? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just need 24 and 25. Could we, could we make the motion discussion. just without 24 and 25? So we'd be moving through 23? Yes. Is that okay, Mr. Bonham? Yeah. I'll second that. Okay, great. Okay. So any other comments from the board members? Keith? Keith? Yeah, sir, I just wanted to point out that the gentleman that was just speaking, the item that he was addressing is part of the consent calendar. Oh, um, so yeah, I'm gonna, for the, yeah, which I'm gonna- Which item was that? Discuss. I'm going to ask for a public comment now on any of the consent items. So, thanks. So you're going to ask for, sorry, <laughs> just for clarification, you'll ask for public comment now. So we can make decisions before. Okay. So we're not going to. Yeah, so we have a motion. Okay. And we have a second. And so uh, we'll hey. ask for Mr. Stelmeyer. Yeah. And, and for. Keith. Thanks for calling that out, Keith. And this is Chuck. I am, um, you know, it might be too many Zoom platforms for me. That's a, that's a great point. And I apologize to Mr. Stella for the, the weirdness of now one minute later asking him to talk. So, which, which item was that, Chuck, that he was referring to on the consent calendar? It's item number seven. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So let's go ahead and get the, ge the gentleman back so you can finish yeah. this conversation with us. Michael, are you there now? Yes, I'm here. Great. Do you have anything else to add? Okay. No, I, I just, uh, you know, I just consider that, you know, for the safety of my crew and my family at near our home and, and, you know, if we could get some signage on the Southern border, I have riparian areas in on my property also adjacent to the Boger property. So when the public comes in to access it, it'd be nice if this, you know, if there was definitive, a definitive line with some signage, you know, if it is approved. And okay. so I'll just, if you consider that, that on the, that was, that's my only concern. All right. And if I may indulge the board, I, appreciate I can, it. sure. Uh, just real quick on that. We do have Joshua Bush, who's uh, the land's, a uh, person up in region two for the Department of Fish and Wildlife whose jurisdiction this property will sit if it's approved. So Josh, are you on and available to just answer briefly whether or not the department would be willing to put signs up? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and thank you, board members. Um, I've, we spoke to Mr. Seidelmeyer prior to the meeting and um, we have agreed and thought it was a good idea to do our best to sign um, the property boundary on the river side. Um, the river is the going to be the only approved access for this property. Um, and I think putting a sign, although difficult with changing water elevations and water flows, uh, maintaining a sign to help orient hunters uh, who are accessing from the river is appropriate. I don't think a buffer zone is doable by the department. Much of this is heavy, dense jungle. I think the opportunities for, you know, a a buffer zone establishment would be very difficult to establish. And I don't think the danger is there due to the dense vegetation between um, the two properties in, in almost all locations. Great, thanks, Josh. Uh, that's... All right, so we do have a motion and a second for consent calendar items five through 23, excluding items 24. So I'll read the 
the motion into the record and then I'll take a roll call vote. So staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board adopt the written findings as appropriate and approve all individual projects identified by staff suitable for funding up to the amounts listed for each and listed as consent calendar items five through 23, excluding agenda items 24 and 25 as identified in the Wildlife Conservation Board final meeting agenda dated November 18th, 2021. Authorize staff to enter into appropriate agreements necessary to accomplish these projects and authorize staff and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to proceed substantially as planned. So with that, uh, Alina Bokde. I mean, I guess just a point of clarification, John, uh, and I don't know if I have to offer like a friendly amendment, um, but I just want to make sure on item number seven that there will be uh you know signage will be part of what will be installed as uh just again as a notification um to hunters or others visiting the property um the project and if there's also i mean i understand the buffer doesn't seem feasible but if there is any other strategy um that can be discussed with the adjacent property owner to try to minimize impact. So is that already planned and kind of incorporated or does that need to come from the board? Yeah, I think probably to make it legit, I think that let's entertain the amendment of that. Okay. Into the motion. So my amendment, uh, friendly amendment to the author and kind of second uh, is to uh, require signage, uh, just appropriate signage um, for notification to hunters and other visitors of, um, you know, of the property line, right, and, and trespass issues, as well as, um, you know, identify if there's any other additional strategies that might minimize uh, the um, trespass issue. I'd accept, that as, yeah, I'd accept that as an amendment. Could I just, um, Ms. Bodke, may I just clarify? It would be to um, consent items five through 23 mm -hmm. as amended to include signage to notify potential trespassers. Is that- For right? item number seven. For, excuse me, for item yeah. number seven, correct. Is that- That's perfect. Yeah, that, right. yeah. the signage Nirvana, and yeah, any other appropriate strategy that and yeah, any other both parties agree to yeah and any other but the signage is whether or not the parties agree so yes any other yeah. strategies is if they agree okay so we're moving items five through 23 with one for item number seven we're including signage to notify trespassers and allowing any other appropriate strategies that both parties agree to mr bonham does that sound it does i'll give you a second great Great, thank you. All right, so Elena Bokday. Aye. Chuck Bonham. Yes. Gil Miller. Aye. Damon Nagami. Yes. Fran Pavley. Yes. Catherine Phillips. Yes. Pete Silva. Aye. Great, motion carries. Thank you, board members, and thank you folks and Michael and Josh for your support and your help on getting us through the consent calendar. So we'll move on to the discussion items in the agenda. This is items, uh, they will be 24 through 38 now. So the first one for presentation, which was taken off consent and will be presented is item number 24, the El Monte Preserve Cactus Scrub Restoration Project. Uh, Kurt Malcho on our staff will present the project to the board. Kurt. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, board members. Um, if we can uh, please um, place the uh, consent item presentation to the um, item number 24. This proposal is considered the allocation for a grant to the Earth Discovery Institute for a cooperative project with the Endangered Habitats Conservancy to restore 15 acres of cactus shrub habitat and the El Monte Preserve to implement part of the County of San Diego Multiple Species Conservation Plan approved in 1998. Next slide, please. 
This plan addresses the conservation and enhancement of 85 species, including the coastal cactus wren, whose conservation is emphasized in this project. The coastal cactus wren is considered a species at high risk of loss without immediate management action due to its persistence in only a few areas and with the associated risks of further habitat fragmentation and genetic isolation. Next slide, please. The multi-species conservation plan identifies current distribution of cactus wren in San Diego region as, I'm sorry, Celestial, could, could you please move back to the previous slide? The uh, cactus wren population in the San Diego region is an isolated cluster, is limited to isolated clusters of nesting populations within three distinct areas, as shown in this map, known as the Otay, San Diego, El Cajon, and San Pascal genetic clusters. Within each of these areas, the linkages between habitat areas are tenuous, and expansion of coastal sage scrub and cactus scrub habitat is needed for dispersal of necessary refugia during wildfire events. Next slide, please. To increase habitat connectivity within the San Diego El Cajon population cluster, the El Monte Preserve has been selected for cactus scrub restoration due to its high potential for successful habitat creation and proximity to several existing habitat areas with resident cactus wren populations. The areas bordered in red on this slide are the proposed restoration sites for cactus scrub, and the yellow lines denote their proximity to existing cactus wren habitat. This project would create 15 acres of cactus scrub habitat to support residency and connectivity for coastal cactus wren. Three additional prioritized species are documented at this site would also benefit from, from this restoration. The California gnat catcher, San Diego horned lizard, and orange throated whiptail. Next slide, please. This image shows one of the proposed cactus scrub restoration sites. Primary restoration activities would begin by dethatching and chemically treating invasive plants by licensed and trained applicators under guidance by integrated pest management protocols. The question was raised as to which herbicide is planned for usage during this step. It is glyphosate. So following invasive plant treatment, restoration would continue through designing and installing an irrigation system, salvaging and translocating cactus from an existing preserve, and conducting two additional weed abatement treatments. Native container plant installation as well as site maintenance will be implemented through 15 volunteer events. Once restored, the Almonte Preserve would provide a regionally significant habitat corridor for cactus wren, supporting critical population viability consistent with regional conservation goals for this species. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve the project as proposed and allocate $484,007 of Proposition 68 funding. I just received in the chat a message from the Sarah uh, Massanuv, the Executive Director for the Earth Discovery Institute, that she will not be available to join into this meeting until three o'clock, but uh, Christine Beck, the conservation director for the Earth Discovery Institute has joined the meeting to address any concerns. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, Christine, if uh, any questions are raised, you can, uh, if you could please uh, use the raise hand function so you can be identified for our meeting. Great, thank you, Kurt. All right, any board member questions? Catherine? So my, it looks like a great project. My concern is the use of glyphosate for um, as an herbicide and how it will be applied and how much will be applied. Um, the application didn't say exactly which one would be applied. So Kurt, I appreciate you noting that. And I'm wondering if, um, if other herbicides have been considered. I've, I noticed on another uh, project that we're gonna be discussing later, imaz imazapir, has been considered. Um, glyphosate, especially in the last couple of years and even most recently, there's been some new research, published um, peer reviewed research in the last year, um, has negative impacts on bees of different sorts, honeybees and um, uh, bumblebees. And um, my concern is that this, is and has been identified uh, by other countries as well, is a um, herbicide that we should be moving away from and finding alternatives to. Uh, it's fairly severe impacts on pollinators. Uh, there's every indication. We're probably only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And so if application's going to occur, 
we have to make sure it's not widespread, it's um, targeted application. And also that it's, if it's going to be applied, that it is applied when the plants are not blooming to reduce the uh, likelihood of getting pollinators involved. But even then, I think it's um, likely that you're gonna, you're gonna end up hitting some pollinators, whether you like it or not. It's just the way these things work. So uh, just as sort of a note, I'm not satisfied. I mean, I'm, I think it's wonderful and <laughs> necessary that people are using licensed um, herbic uh, pesticide applicators, but um, that isn't enough because uh, just sort of my research over the last couple of weeks indicates that a lot of the, the applicators are not familiar with the most recent research and the impacts on bees and uh, other pollinators. And there's also a dearth of information, even some of the, the, the IPM databases have yet to come up to date. I mean, I think all of us are behind on different things because of the uh, impact of COVID, but um, it just takes time to update databases. So all of that said, has the ap applicant considered alternatives to glyphosate and um, A, and then if not, if glyphosate is gonna be the the uh, herbicide of choice, what considerations have gone into ensuring that a minimal amount of um, pollinators will be impacted? Hey, Catherine, if I could, this is Chuck. Um, before staff or the proponent may answer, and I realize you're asking them the question, I'd like to take a moment and just ask the board and, and particularly you, Catherine, if we could if we could use this moment to step back for a second um, and kind of go through a little bit of how we want to self-govern as a board member of seven, a board of seven members. So I think these are legit questions and I don't have a problem with them being raised. I think that's our job as board members to raise questions when we see concerns. And it Similar discussions happened at the prior board meeting. And my understanding is we may have up to three other agenda items today where you might raise a similar concern. So instead of going project by project, what, what, is, what is your thought on an end game here? Is it some structure for these particular types of projects that may have some template stipulation like the proponent, the applicants have to confirm a process to use other techniques, you know, prioritize things other than glyphosate. But if they're going to use glyphosate, then a checklist to illustrate, you know, it's minimal application, sound grounding. I mean, like what, what is the, how do we do something that's standardized so our community can see it adapt to it and then when when these projects come to the board we're not we keep keep having the conversation over and over um i think not of uh, bringing projects to the board that include the use of glyphosate would be a, a good start okay so let me <laughs> i mean know. my my goal is to see that we are not using spending public money on something that is as toxic um, and potentially harmful to pollinators as the research is continuing to show this maybe. Okay, so um, but that, you know, that's that's the end goal. But I don't I don't pretend to think I'm gonna be able to overnight stop the use of glyphosate or stop the use of public funds to support projects that use glyphosate. I think each of these projects that are coming up today, they've provided different approaches to how they're uh -huh. gonna use it. And I uh -huh. think what I would like to see, especially just stepping back a little bit, I mean, I don't like to be in the position of having to be the glyphosate police, but if you notice what we, where we have gone is to a place where there isn't, um, there isn't CEQA for some of these projects and for a lot of projects for good reason in the sense that people need to get these projects done. The expectation is that they will be good for the environment, not bad for the environment. 
But if you were going through a CEQA process, you'd have somebody overlooking and saying, well, wait a minute, what, how are you mitigating the impacts or the potential impacts for something like the use of a, of a, of a glyphosate? So, it, you know, maybe you can help us figure out what the process should be, because at this point, I don't know what to do other than to raise the issue and say, I don't want to be voting for projects that are using glyphosate. Fair enough. I think if you look at page 67 and 68 of this agenda for this agenda item, there's something there that's general. Um, you know, for this project, herbicides would be used as one of the tools. The use will be minimized to meet the need. The application has to be consistent with other procedures to assess all factors around ecological impacts and the process must include evaluating other methods as well. I think if you took something that's existing in our agenda items that's general like that, but maybe build it out more specifically and that becomes almost a required template, that's a higher level of information we have coming to us as board members. That'd be a step one in my mind. Step two, Look, the reality is it's a board member, a board comprised of seven, right? So we've got to find a way for each of our inputs to also funnel into how do we want to handle ourselves when we get around to voting the items, right? So each of these four things today that may relate to herbicide use all come with other conservation group support, the county of San Diego, San Diego governments and in in the mayor. So we're gonna end up with a frustrated community pool who's trying to do good projects, waiting for us as a board to kind of think through and solidify an approach to this. And I'm worried about that dynamic as well. Well, you know, I've talked to the Pro Tem's office about my concern and I, I know I have their support on this one. Um, they're concerned about the use of uh, glyphosate in projects. So, you know, I think it's worth figuring out what an approach can be so that future projects don't come to us um, proposing generally that they'll use herbicides, not specifying what they're going to be using, and not ensuring us that they'll mitigate the impacts as much as possible. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a start. I'd also like to see um, preference given to projects that find alternatives to using herbicides. Um, you know, I recognize that there are going to be times when, for lots of reasons, you can't avoid all herbicides, but there are alternative herbicides to glyphosate. Um, some of them don't work as fast, and, um, you know, that's a problem for, for some projects if you're on a, a tight deadline. But there's got to be some way that, that competitive projects um, are brought to us that don't rely on something that potentially harms um, the, the pollinators. Hey, so any other board member, I appreciate y'all's indulgence for Catherine and I to, to chat. And for the public, I mean, this is the way the process works. We don't talk to each other offline because we're respectful of public meeting requirements. And we come together with you and we debate issues as a board in public. So the public may be wondering why we're having this back and forth. That's how it's supposed to work. Any other board members broadly, or then we can turn back to this agenda item. Um, I can't tell Catherine whether you, you know, this is questioning, but you are open to a board member making a motion. You may just vote, vote no. So any other board members want to weigh in on the policy or the project issue? I'll just offer a, a comment, and um, so we so it is somehow addressed. I think Chuck, you were on the right on the right track in when they were spelling it out um, to be a little more specific, and they look at uh, certain uh, categories of herbicides that would be destructive to pollinators. Um, and look at other options first. 
and if if uh, there are no other options available, um, uh, then uh, we would know that. Um, some may do that intentionally or unintentionally if there were options available. So it was just sort of basing off like a checkoff list when they're submitting things that they're using and had considered uh, other options or something like uh, that. So it wasn't just the unintended consequences of using something without realizing the cumulative impact. So maybe there's a way to build it in for the February meetings. Um, we had this brief discussion, if I remember correctly, prior to this. And so I could see this being an ongoing concern. So there must be a way to, um, in the legitimate, it's not really a SQL requirement, but checkoff list that they, if they're using herbicides, what type uh, and for what specific purpose and to what extent will they be avoiding use of uh, herbicides that will affect pollinators. And there, it, it's an issue in, uh, for many people and in other parts, I know Ventura County has concerns with uh, that and local governments have the ability, I think, to uh, ban it as well, which is one place um, Catherine could go if that's what <laughs> San Diego County wants to do. So I, I, I'm just trying to help facilitate the discussion and um, uh, for the future and uh, people sort of smarter than I can figure out how it could just be addressed in your review in, in future applications. Thank you, Senator. And look, John, I, I do want to say as, as chair, we shouldn't come to another meeting and have this question embedded in a bunch of agenda items and have for a third time the same debate. So I'd like to ask that, uh, you know, Board Director Donnelly call up the department's bee specialists. So we, we have our, a fair amount of pollinator folks and we ourselves are managing the defense of pollinators through among other things, litigation around their, whether they're covered under state law and endangered species act. So we care about pollinators and, and see if uh, you can produce some, let's call it template that is much more specific than the general uh, four sentences on page 67 and 68. And then let's have a discussion. Now you, you gotta be mindful of what you put on the next agenda about this amongst ourselves. And yeah, no, that's totally doable, Chuck, and I, I would be happy to do that. And we have already started those discussions with your experts at the department. Uh, we have engaged and we have a list of UC folks that we're going to be contacting as well. We've had some offline conversations with Catherine as well. And we're, we're prepared to move forward on that very thing uh, and even ask different kinds of questions in our application packages uh, for these kinds of projects, you know, to get more specific, more specificity. And then not only specificity from the perspective of the kinds of herbicide that will be used, but what is the cost of the different alternatives, you know, uh, you know, because if you have uh, one that takes a longer amount of time, it could be more expensive, but we need to know that kind of stuff. If we're going to do a an adequate job for you all. So where that's the kind of stuff that we're thinking right now. We do have the department's expert on standby right now. If there was any specific questions that you all have uh, that we could answer or she could answer uh, at this time. Uh, uh, but be happy to yeah. do that. And we're planning on doing that, Chuck. So. And maybe there's an incentive if they are coming up with a better solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might cost them a little more, but they, right. There's some benefit to it also. Yeah. And if anybody that's, that's listening should now realize if it's bring a project kind of status quo on this topic, it's going to get questioned because we at least have one or more board members who will ask the questions. Right. So, you know, pay attention applicant community as well. All right, so Catherine, Sorry, but thank you for letting us kick it up a level to more general. Sure. And I, how do you want to, any other board member questions about project 24 and the applicants 
conservation director, I think is on the phone. Um, if she wants to respond, because it was your question originally. Like yeah, how would... I, I think it would be good to have a response. Okay, okay I'm here. Um, my name is Christine Beck, and I actually retired from the department as a senior environmental scientist. And I worked um, in the NCCP program for 12 years. So I'm pretty knowledgeable about the habitats and here in San Diego County and also um, restoration through viewing mitigation, restoration sites, and just general restoration. Um, I've actually been on site visits with John Donnelly on some of our projects down here. And um, so we also don't wanna harm. We want to make um, habitat better. So just a, a few um, items that may not alleviate your concerns, but um, I wanna put them out there anyway, is that the concentration of the glyphosate that is used in restoration is generally 1%, where um, what you would buy at Home Depot is typically 8%. So it is a more diluted um, solution and it is very um, targeted and, and they work very hard to um, control overspray. Um, also, um, the Earth Discovery Institute is actually part of the San Diego Pollinator Alliance, which is a local organization here in San Diego County to promote uh, pollinator health and uh, restoration for pollinators throughout the county. We currently um, started a native milkweed farm to benefit uh, monarch butterflies. So we are very um, committed to pollinator conservation and at a site like El Monte, you can see that the majority of the site is non-native grasses. And these grasses have probably been present on the site for um, since the last wildfire went through, so maybe 2003. So it's got a substantial seed bank. And um, weed whipping the site is a possibility, but then you have emissions. Um, you could also kill ground dwelling species such as the um, sensitive lizards that are on site and even um, insects. So we could solarize, um, but on this scale, it would be incredibly difficult. Plus then we have all that plastic that ends up in the landfill. So each kind of tool that we have in our toolbox has benefits and it also has um, neg negatives, I guess you could say. Um, but in the, again, it kind of goes back to, we have two growing seasons to install our habitat and you're not gonna deplete the seed bank um, probably using any of these options, but glyphosate um, is one of our better tools. And I can work with Recon, that is our subcontractor that's gonna prep our site for us. They are doing the, um, the removal of the, doing the dethatch and, um, any chemical treatments that would be involved. And I can uh, work with them to see if there is an alternative so that we are not using glyphosate. Um, they have 20 years of experience doing habitat restoration in the county. And um, they're the reason that I reached out to them because they're also the expert for cactus scrub restoration and they've done many projects to benefit cactus run. So um, I can work with them and see if there's another option that that we could use. Um, Fusillade will target grasses um, and other species, but protect our perennial grasses. So um, I'm not a chemical expert or an herbicide expert by any means, but one thing to keep in mind is currently the site, because it is mostly non-native species, isn't probably supporting very many pollinators, let alone our native pollinators. But when this project is completed and the cactus is growing, I can tell you that um, prickly pear cactus supports hundreds of bees. Um, I have them, we've been planting cactus in, in the canyon in our backyard and um, I have many native bees now in my yard and one flower, I had four bees there. So I think, um, you know, at the end of the day when this project's done and it will be successful, we'll have many, many more pollinators on the site. So thank you for um, allowing me to speak today. Great, thank you, Christine. Uh, all right, any other comments from board members? Catherine? 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate that explanation, Christine. And I appreciate what you're saying about going back to recon and seeing um, what the alternatives might be, other ways to work around it so that you don't use or at least reduce and certainly do a, a very targeted use if you're gonna continue using glyphosate. Um, so thank you for that, that explanation and your willingness to um, go back and have them review that. You're, I don't know, my, you're, you're welcome. And I, I just wanna ensure I've spent my whole career on resource protection here in the county. And our goal is really to, um, you know, it's a biodiversity hotspot here. And I would um, invite you to come down anytime and see this restoration site and other conserved properties that we work on. And um, you could meet staff from Recon and, um, maybe it would alleviate some of your concerns and maybe it wouldn't, but I did some research today and we have over 167 non-native plant species in the county that we um, are trying to contend with. And just with climate change, increased fire, um, you know, the demands of recreation, um, our biodiversity down here is suffering and, and anything we can do to promote restoration, I think that is our, our best tool to overcome those threats. And um, so I thank you WCB and the board for um, funding our project. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, so how does the board wanna handle this? I was planning on doing one motion at the end, but if we're can have individual motions on these and there might be some differences and different voting from board members. Do you wanna have this, you wanna have a motion on this particular item and then we'll do the yeah, next one? My sense is uh, it'd be most diplomatic when, when something's pulled off consent, we also you know, have a specific motion for it and you know that allows folks to, to vote as they feel they need rather than rolling it up into a macro vote at the end. That's my instinct, just anticipating you know, where we all might be as board members. Great. Okay, so do I have a, um, does somebody wanna move the motion? I'll make a motion that the, Board approve agenda item 24. And now I, as staff recommends, subject to taking Miss Beck up on her invitation. And as the project proponent, her kind of assurance that she will continue to explore, push, and manage to minimize the use of the herbicide. I'll second that, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Gail. So I do, we didn't have any public comment on this. Do I need to ask the public if there's any public comment out there that would like to speak on this? And I would like to ask that we don't get in to the back and forth about the use of herbicide, but whether, you know, if you have any specific or general comments about the project itself. All right, seeing no hands raised. So with that motion, I'll do a roll call vote. So Alina Bokday. Chuck Bonham. Yes. Gil Miller. Aye. Damon Nagami. Yes. Rand Pavley. Yes. Catherine Phillips. Yes. Pete Silva. Yes. Great, thank you. So Alina, are you back on? Did we lose you? I see you there. Well, maybe she had to step away. All right, well, motion carries. Uh, so we'll move on to item number 25. This is the Morrison Pond Restoration and Enhancement Project in San Diego. Kurt Malcho will also uh, present you the project. Kurt? Thank you, John. 
Uh, this proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the San Diego County Department of Parks and Recreation for a project to restore 3.45 acres of coastal sage scrub habitat and enhance 19.3 acres of riparian habitat located on Sweetwater Summit Regional Park in San Diego County. Next slide, please. Morrison Pond contains some of San Diego's most sensitive and ecologically significant habitats and natural areas, supporting hundreds of important plant and animal species. This project would implement conservation goals outlined in the San Diego County Multi-Species Conservation Plan, San Diego Sub-Area Plan, particularly those goals attributed to increasing linkages between core habitat areas for Lee's Bells Vireo, California Gnat Catcher, and Cactus Wren. Next slide, please. Currently, Morrison Pond and the adjacent upland habitat contain many invasive weeds, including giant reed, shown in this image, tamarisk, castor bean, and non-native grasses, to name a few. Next slide, please. Invasive non-native plants are impacting the health and function of the habitats in the proposed project area, in addition to increasing fire potential, altering vegetation structure, displacing native plant species, and degrading habitat that is critical for protected species. Next slide, please. Upland areas around the pond are also highly disturbed and denuded of vegetation with large expanses of exposed bare soil. To address these issues, the proposed project would first remove and treat invasive non-native plant species impacting riparian habitat, then create approximately three and a half acres of coastal sage scrub habitat in the upland transition zone, and also plant cactus to benefit cactus wren. Regarding invasive plant treatment, herbicide would be used to control or remove invasive non-native species before they are able to produce seed and reinfest the site. The County Department of Parks and Recreation has a licensed agricultural pest control advisor on staff and herbicides be selected according to integrated pest management protocols only after non-chemical pest control methods have been considered and evaluated. Restoring and enhancing these areas will establish and maintain a functional vegetation buffer around the pond and ensure invasive non-native species do not reestablish in the riparian areas after removal and treatment. Once restored, the project site would have regional significance as it is intended to function as a stepping stone for gnat catcher and cactus wren habitat connectivity to adjacent suitable habitat. In addition, this area would increase refuge habitat if a catastrophic fire occurs in the preserved land that connects to this corridor and in the general vicinity. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed and allocate $397,185 of Proposition 68 funding. Anna Perwant, biologist and environmental planner for San Diego County Parks and Rec, Dario Lombardo, agricultural scientist with the San Diego County Parks and Rec, and Brian Albright, Director for County of San Diego Parks and Recreation, have joined the meeting to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, board member questions, Catherine. So, so this is very much like the conversation we just had. One of the, the things I'm wondering though is, um, there will be twice per year removal herbicide treatment of all invasive non-native vegetation for four years is what I've been told. So twice per year for four years. Um, what we're seeing here in these photos, I'm assuming these, I don't know what time of year this is, but it looks cloudy and that sort of thing. So I'm assuming it's not spring. Um, it's not after rainfall. Um, so what we're seeing is an area that looks very uninviting even to pollinators. But if you're doing it twice per year, does that mean you're gonna hit those times of the year when you're more likely to um, risk contamination of pollinators? Kurt, do you have any of the uh, applicants uh, raise their hands so they can be identified to respond to this? Anna? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. First of all, thank you for the questions and appreciate the opportunity to speak as well. Um, our goal is to minimize the impacts as much as feasible. So we could apply them, the herbicide during the time of year when it would be least impactful to pollinators. Um, that being said, if I'm happy to discuss as well your other questions, Catherine, um, if you'd like me to respond to the ones that you asked previously to Christine Beck. 
I think that would be helpful if that if the chair if you're fine with that Chuck. Yes, for sure. Thank you. Um, first, in my background, I am a biologist for the County of San Diego Parks and Recreation Department, as well as a land use environmental planner. And so I coordinated closely with Helix Environmental because they are experts in restoration. To And we have discussed in great length that we want to make sure that the herbicide use and spray is minimized to the extent feasible. That being said, we did have some background discussions before proposing what we did for the project, which includes uh, Amanzapir, which has some pre-emergent activity and therefore could negatively impact the native seeds that are present uh, and proposed to be installed, as well as the native plants proposed to be installed. It also has pre-emergent activity and so it hampers the germination of native species. As a systemic herbicide, glyphosate would treat the weed foliage above the ground in addition to the roots but unlike emancipier, glyphos uh, sorry, glyphosate is known to have little to no soil residual, meaning it rapidly bonds to the clay particles in the soil and would render the herbicide inactive, unlike emancipier. So this would allow the herbicide to kill annual and perennial weeds that are invasive and would outcompete the native plants. When the invasive non-native plants would outcompete the native habitat or native plants, this ultimately could lead to the habitat type conversion that destroys native habitat necessary for our rare threatened and endangered species. Therefore, the weeds that can be treated, such as below native shrubs and trees, without damaging native plants, allowing for increased native food, um, habitat, and nesting locations for the native species, especially rare, threatened, endangered species, given that San Diego County has more listed species than any other county in the con continental United States. And so the protection from the non-native invasive species is imperative. And then in regard to the other question that you asked, the usage of only mechanical weed control methods would be infeasible for this restoration project, even if the project had the funds to do so. By using the approved chemical methods according to the integrated pest management strategy, soil erosion and disturbance to the natural environment is minimized. In addition, by using only post-emergence herbicides, the seed germination of the native plants is not inhibited. In addition to herbicides, invasive non-native vegetation growing within 12 inches of native vegetation be it either existing plants or vegetation establishing from container plants or seed would be removed by hand. Mechanical methods such as a line trimmer would also be used in areas with low native cover. However, to avoid damaging establish, establishing native vegetation, use of line trimmers would only be limited to areas with larger areas with no native plants. The use of manual weed control when warranted and line trimmers as appropriate were included in the maintenance cost estimate. Herbicide will be used to control and remove the invasive non-native species before they're able to produce seed and reinfest the site. The herbicide would be applied using backpack sprayers at the recommended concentration provided by the herbicide label and per state guidelines, and the spray would be minimized. Herbicide to be used is recommended by the California Licensed Agricultural Pest Control Advisors for the treatment of non-native invasive species. And the herbicide would be applied under the supervision of a staff member with, with a qualified applicator license. So the County Department of Parks and Recreation actually has a licensed agricultural pest control advisor and herbicides are selected according to the integrated pest management strategies only after non-chemical pest control methods have been considered and evaluated. Also, the integrated pest management process ensures the herbicides are used only after monitoring indicates they are needed according to established guidelines and treatments are made with the goal of removing only the target organisms. We do not anticipate any impact. We do not anticipate impacts to wildlife or humans from the use of the herbicides as they will be used according to the label in coordination with the licensed pest control advisor and in close coordination with our environmental consultants to ensure that they are only used when necessary and minimizing the spray. Thank you. And that would include pollinators? Yes, we don't, we would minimize impacts to the extent feasible. And when you do it twice a year, what times of the year do you do it then? That is a great question. It would be when, um, Dario, do you mind chiming in on this? He has more expertise in this aspect than I do. So. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dario Lombardo. I'm um, in charge of the IPM program for the Department of Parks and Recreation. I'm a licensed pest control advisor with the uh, California Department of uh, Pesticide Regulation. Um, we will pay a lot of attention based on the blooming on the invasive species. Um, I assume uh, those kind of treatment would be done to control uh, both uh, 
the winter annual and the summer annual invasive species. So uh, I assume uh, most of the spray will be done uh, depending also on the rains. Uh, uh, I know we are going toward a very dry winter. Uh, so it is difficult now to anticipate when the pesticide application will be done. It always depends on the, on the weather and the precipitations. So are you trying to spray when the plants are flowering or when they are not flowering? when they are not flowering to protect pollinators. Uh, it's important, especially uh, with herbicide application uh, to control when the plants at, are at the early stages uh, is uh, really useless. And also um, I wouldn't encourage to uh, treat uh, uh, at the later stage because it would involve uh, uh, more use of uh, active ingredients. So usually the tendency is to spray when we are at the sealing stage. Thank you, that answers my questions. And, and I, appre I appreciate, uh, it sounds like you've put a lot of thought into this. And I appreciate that you're going to look for ways to do um, uh, manual control or alternatives to glyphosate when those are appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board questions for staff or the project proponent? Okay, any other public comments? All right, seeing none, does somebody wanna move this item? Oh, I'll do it. Um, this is Chuck, I'll make a motion. Uh, the board approve agenda item 25 as defined in the staff recommendation subject to a similar approach that the, the county staff remain engaged with the WCB board staff and take all practicable steps to minimize use and application to avoid, you know, unintended consequences. Second. Second. Who was that? Gail. Gail, great, thank you, Gail. All right, Alina Book Day. Chuck Bonham. Yes. Gail Miller. Hi. Damon Nagami. Yes. Rand Pavley. Yes. Catherine Phillips? Yes. Pete Silva? Yes. Great, motion passes. Thank you, board members. So we'll move on to item number 26 in the agenda. This is to consider the Los Gatos Creek Watershed Fire Resiliency Project in Santa Clara and Santa Cruz County. Judah Grossman on our staff will present the project. Judah? Thanks, John. I don't see the slides. Maybe yeah, I'm... Celeste had a change. Okay. So sure. she's now we're... Great. All right. Thank you, John and members of the board. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District for a cooperative project with CAL FIRE to reduce hazardous fire fuels and improve forest resiliency on 353 acres of open space preserves in the Los Gatos Creek watershed, five miles northeast of Los Gatos in Santa Clara and Santa Cruz counties. Uh, this location map shows several open space preserves in red. Project work will comprise 353 acres within those preserves. California's fire season is increasingly severe due in part to a buildup of fire fuels and a changing climate. Contributing factors include over a century of fire suppression activities, pest and disease pressures, drought conditions, and the expansion of the wildland urban interface. We're experiencing increased risk 
and consequences of severe wildfires in California. Next slide, please. A number of partners, including the Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, have come together to form the Los Gatos Creek Watershed Collaborative Forest Health Grant Project. This collaborative project encompasses 960 acres, has received an award from CAL FIRE's Forest Health Grant Program, and aims to improve forest health, protect water resources, and promote long-term carbon storage while managing vegetative fuels to reduce fire intensity and severity. The 353-acre project under consideration today is part of that larger Los Gatos Creek Watershed Collaborative. The proposed project includes fuels reduction, thinning forest and underbrush, reforestation on three prior plantation sites, restoration of a eucalyptus growth, so removing eucalyptus trees to establish native plants, and outreach through educational video and signage. The photos on this slide are from the Sierra Azul Open Space Preserve and offer examples of the dense vegetative growth to be thinned as part of the proposed project. Next slide, please. These photos uh, from the Bear Creek's Redwoods Open Space Preserve show additional examples of dense forest and underbrush to be thinned. Next slide, please. The left and center photographs on this slide show prior plantations to be thinned. Note the uniform age structure, closely spaced trees, and ladder fuels, so brush and low hanging limbs that could lead to a crown fire in these stands. The photograph on the right shows restoration plantings in the foreground and a dense plantation remaining in the background. Next slide, please. These photographs are from the Sierra Azul Open Space Preserve and they show eucalyptus trees to be removed and replaced with native plantings. Next slide. Sensitive resources in the project area will be protected during implementation. And these photos show native manzanita plants being flagged for protection. Next slide, please. This slide shows a wood rat nest as another example of sensitive resources in the project area. In this case, wood rat nests would be flagged for protection and moved only if necessary. Next slide. This final slide shows a ponded area in Bear Creek Red Redwoods Open Space Preserve that would be protected during acti project activities as well. Staff recommends the project as proposed. I'm happy to answer any questions that the board might have. And on the call today, we have guests from the Mid-Peninsula Region Open Space District, including Deborah Hurst, Grants Program Manager, Cody Cifuentes Winter, Senior Resource Manage Management Specialist, and Michael Gorman, Foothills Area Manager. Great, thank you, Judah. Any board member questions? Catherine, more. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, this is just a, a comment and a request. First, I'd, I'd like to thank the WCB staff for how quickly they responded and how completely they responded to my questions about this project and a later one, I, I really appreciate the follow through very much. Um, I think we all know the, the risks facing California from wildfire. And I hope should the WCB approve this project today that will be kept abreast of some of the monitoring work that comes out of this in the future. Thank you. Yeah, we would be happy to keep you updated. Hey, John, this is Fran Pavley. I appreciate Catherine's uh, comment. That'll be something we're wa watch I'm watching too. And it was sort of related to my question on that general fund expenditures uh, that sort of were indirectly for a variety of purposes from habitat restoration to um, uh, fire resiliency. And so um, it's usually CAL FIRES um, jurisdiction, but admittedly, they perhaps don't have all the careful CEQA and research um, uh, capabilities that WCB uh, has, but uh, due to the severity of the issue, statements of overriding consideration um, are always uh, something that um, becomes timely and, and apparent where there's not a lot of other options. I do know that it was, I have relatives in the Monterey County area. There was a uh, um, prescribed burn um, 
Yeah, just a month or so ago, but it was during fire season that was started in Mount Madonna area or somewhere in Monterey or Santa Cruz County. And it got out of control quickly because the, the drought conditions are so bad, you can't control. <laughs> you can't control even um, what you think are well-managed wildfires when they're intentionally started and it, it created a lot of problems. So uh, this, this is a, a challenge. I'm not uh, opposing this. I'm just raising it. This is a very complicated issue. And I think as Catherine suggested, uh, monitoring and seeing uh, the impacts, uh, unattended impacts as well as benefits from uh, going in this direction and when to allow this to occur uh, based on real conditions on the ground, like how dry the soil is, et cetera, uh, may, may be relevant. So um, it's definitely something to follow and I'll be supporting this today. Great, thank you, Senator. Any other board member comments? John, this is Chuck, just to Thank confirm, you. we're now in the space where your suggestion is roll it to the omnibus motion at the end, correct? Correct, yes. Yes, that's not my intention, thank you. Yep, and so that's always, uh, as we go along, any board member discretion, if you wanna pull something out of the omnibus and make it an individual roll call. Thanks, John. Yep, thank you. All right, seeing no other board member hands raises and any member of the public wishing to speak. All right, whoops, there's a hand. Cody? Good afternoon. Uh, this is Cody C. Fuentes Winter on the Supervisory Vegetation Ecologist for Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space. Um, I just want to express gratitude to the WCB for listening in to us today um, in regards to this. And I just wanted to make well, one quick point, um, and that is when we, um, Mid Pen, talks about fire resiliency, uh, we're actually talking about the ecosystem resiliency of the area. So the this areas that we are looking at um, have been excluded from fire for um, well over a century. Um, and the, the rates of uh, the amount of trees we have per acre in these locations is extremely high and out and in uh, unnatural conditions. And so the, the object of this uh, project really is to get it back to a quote unquote more natural state that we're looking for um, at these locations. Um, and the reforestation that we're doing, um, which is highly needed for these areas uh, because of the use of cultivar trees, um, there is a, a lot of concern around genetics and how the, the cultivar trees, which are mostly Douglas fir, um, that they are contributing to what we call genetic drift. Um, and can have an, a lasting impact on our native stands that we do have here. Uh, but once again, I wanna say thank you very much for listening in to us. And um, I, I look forward to uh, hearing uh, and providing uh, updates and uh, monitoring ports to the WCB. Thank you. Great, thank you, Cody. Any other public comment? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to item number 27 in the agenda. So this is a Grasslands Ecological Area Water Conveyance Enhancement Project in Merced County. James Croft of our staff will present the project to the members. And... Thank you, John. This project was selected to be presented to the board for funding consideration from the 2020 Pacific Flyway Conservation Solicitation. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to Grassland Resource Conservation District for a cooperative project with the Grassland Water District to complete water delivery infrastructure improvements within the Grasslands Ecological Area in Merced County. The project area is on land owned and operated by the Grassland Water District. The wetlands within the broader Grasslands Ecological Area make up the largest remaining contiguous freshwater complex west of the Rocky Mountains and encompasses over 160,000 acres of habitat and wildlife beneficial agriculture. These wetlands are designated as a critically important habitat area by two international treaties, numerous wildlife organizations, and are recognized as among the five most important wetland ecosystems in North America. Next slide, please. 
The objective of the project is to improve critical water delivery infrastructure within the grasslands ecological area and provide improved water delivery capacity to over 46,000 acres of managed seasonal wetlands. This project encompasses nine enhancements that will result in the proved geometry of approximately 11 miles of water delivery infrastructure and will install five key water delivery points for these wetlands. The first uh, project for this one, or first, first sub project, excuse me, uh, the non functional head wall and culvert on the Santa Fe Canal at the existing bypass of Mud Slough will be demolished, recycled, and a new structure will be constructed. The new structure will increase water conveyance capacity to North Grasslands wetlands. Next slide, please. A degraded structure on the San Luis Canal will be demolished and recycled and replaced with a structure that will, pro will provide increased water delivery efficiency to nearby wetlands, particularly at high flows. Next slide, please. The channel geometry of the mosquito ditch restricts flow and limits the ability to maintain and operate delivery infrastructure along the ditch. Two miles of this channel will be reformed to create a more efficient and maintainable cross section. Next slide, please. The channel geometry of this stretch of the San Luis Canal restricts flow and limits the ability to maintain and operate water delivery infrastructure along the ditch. 2.7 miles of this channel and, and 1.8 miles of the Santa Fe cross channel, including 4.4 miles of the Santa Fe Canal, will be reformed to create a more efficient and maintainable cross section. I've got one photo here of those three canal sections, uh, the three canals, very similar. Next slide, please. The Agatha Canal is, a, is the key delivery channel into the grassland district and, it is, and is severely undersized for the delivered flows. The banks are damaged and impassable and lateral structures are not accessible for maintenance. The existing inlet and banks will be repaired to allow for both efficient water delivery and improved maintenance access. A series of non-functional water control structures in the Agatha Poso Canal will also be replaced to allow for water delivery to adjacent wetland units. Next slide, please. Undersized drain structures on the 240 ditch cause flooding on a local roadway and impedes wetland management and adjacent wetland units. The existing drain structure will be removed and replaced with an appropriately sized structure. These water delivery improvements will result in significant water savings, increased seasonal wetland productivity, improved drought resilience, and improved security of one of the most important wetland complexes in the Pacific Flyway. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. On Zoom today to answer any questions you may have is Mr. Rick Ortega, General Manager from the Grassland Resource Conservation District. Thank you. Thanks, James. Any board member comments, questions for staff? All right, seeing no hands raised. Any public members, any public wishing to comment? Uh, so I do see a hand. Couple hands. Now I can't. Celeste, do you know whose hand? Oh, Mark Smith. Yes, uh, this is Mark Smith on behalf of California Waterfowl Association, uh, just expressing our support for this project and this funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So, Rick. Yes, thank you, Rick Ortega, General Manager of the Grassland Water District and Resource Conservation District. Um, an incredibly important project for us uh, to, to move forward um, and appreciate the consideration. Uh, thank you again, staff, for working closely with us uh, to, to refine this project. Great, thank you. Any other comments? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item number 28 in the agenda. This is the San Joaquin River Parkway, River West Eaton Trail Extension Planning Project. Uh, in Fresno County, Erin Aquino Carhart of our staff will present the board the project. Erin. Thank you, John. Thank you, more uh, members of the board. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a planning grant with the City of Fresno for a cooperative project to de develop final engineering designs and secure permitting for public access improvements to River West in the San Joaquin River Parkway. The project is located on River West and on a publicly, a public and privately owned land. 
along the south side of the San Joaquin River between Highway 49, uh, 41 excuse me, and Spano Park. Near the intersection of Palm Avenue and Nees Avenue within the city of Fresno in Fresno County. And as you might notice that there is a small um, uh, disconnected piece uh, south, uh, south of the project area that is actually four residential properties um, that are along Audubon Drive and that will be redesigned uh, for public safety. So that is considered within the project area, but uh, it is not part of the, the, the public access portion of it. And also to provide you a bit more context, especially since we have new board members, uh, this project is uh, part of the San Joaquin River Conservancy Program, which uh, WCB and the Conservancy work in partnership to select our, our projects. And it has recently been approved by their board in their September 2021 meeting. And this project advances uh, the, pro the Conservancy's mission for public access and a, a contiguous parkway. And this project will open a key section of the parkway to the public and uh, connect nearly 500 acres of open space and the San Joaquin River. And that will be done by the extension of the existing Lewis Eaton Trail. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the proposed map that shows um, the planned access points. Um, the, the icons that are marked with a uh, letter P with the blue circles are for planned parking for each of the access points. And the orange circle with a B is actually bus parking. So in addition to um, the different public access features, which would be parking and this bus parking, uh, there will also be um, pet stations and bathrooms, et cetera. So the CEQA compliance was completed in a previous phase for this project, and the project will continue the planning for implementation of the extension of the Eaton Trail from Woodward Park westward under Highway 41 and downstream along the San Joaquin River for approximately uh, two and a half miles. The three access points to River West um, will be, again, with parking and other amenities. And the following slides will show photos of the existing sites where these access points will be planned and from east to west as they appear in the map. So Spano Park, Riverview Drive, and Highway 1 and Perrin Avenue. Next slide, please. So this is the view from Spano Park, and this is the future uh, access road and where the parking will be uh, for the Palm Avenue. And next slide, please. This is the river uh, view access, uh, the planned river view access. This will actually go through um, an existing uh, residential neighborhood, which, um, which is the reason why the, the intersection of Audubon will be redesigned for, for public safety. Uh, next slide. So this intersection of Del Mar and Audubon leads into the, the Riverview access area. And so because there is um, a projected increase in uh, traffic and for public safety reasons, uh, this will be redesigned by the city of Fresno uh, to uh, address those issues and also to encourage more pedestrian and uh, bicycling traffic. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the Parent Avenue access point. Uh, and the third of, of the different uh, access points that will be uh, created. Staff recommends the board approve this project as proposed and Jesus Avieta, uh, the deputy city engineer with the city of Fresno and John Shelton, the executive officer with the San, River Conservan San Joaquin River Conservancy are available for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Any board member comments or questions for staff? All right, seeing no hands raised. Any public members wanting to speak? 
on this particular project. All right, seeing no hands raised. Thank you, Aaron. We'll move on to item number 29 in the agenda. This is the Car Lake Restoration Planning Project in Monterey County. Uh, Kurt Malchow will present this project to the board. Kurt. Thank you, John. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Big Sur Land Trust for a cooperative project with the Laurel Foundation to complete the planning and permitting needed to restore up to 67 acres of wetland repairing an adjacent upland habitat within the Car Lake Basin. Next slide, please. The Car Lake Basin seen in the upper middle part of this image is a 480 acre patch of agricultural fields located in the center of Salinas, Monterey County's largest city with a population of over 160,000 people. Next slide, please. What used to be a wetland area over a century ago, Car Lake was the largest of a seven lake system that captured water from the upper Gavilan watershed located northeast and east of Salinas through Gavilan, Natividad, and Alisal Creeks before discharging into a network of creeks and wetlands that ran out to Monterey Bay. During the early part of the 20th century, these creek systems that once flowed naturally through Car Lake were channelized and a reclamation ditch was built downstream to drain Car Lake. The resulting Car Lake Basin was converted into farmland at the beginning in the 1920s. As you can see in the center of the image, these channelized tributaries enter a choke point as they converge into the reclamation ditch, which has insufficient capacity to handle runoff from large storms. But even in this heavily modified state, the area still serves as a critical stormwater detention area that relieves flood pressure on the surrounding developed areas. Next slide, please. In an effort to begin reversing these negative trends in habitat, water quality, and flood conveyance, the Big Sur Land Trust purchased a 73-acre portion of the Car Lake Basin in 2017, seen highlighted here, to create an open space area, a multi-benefit park. The site has already been extensively studied in preparation for and during a preliminary design process to achieve the goals of restoring up to 67 acres of wetland and riparian habitat, improving water quality by enhancing natural processes and green infrastructure, maintaining and expanding flood conveyance, and also creating a neighborhood park in the remaining six acres to offer additional recreational opportunities. Currently, there are only 1.7 acres of park space per 1,000 people in Salinas, transforming a portion of Car Lake to an urban park and green space for the local community with multiple natural resource benefits has been envisioned by the city leadership and residents for decades. Funding from this grant would allow the Big Sur Land Trust to realize this vision through finalizing the planning and design work and secure local, state, and federal permits and approvals for shovel-ready restoration projects upon completion. Next slide, please. This image shows the current condition of the creek systems running through the property, channelized and devoid of habitat. This is the confluence of Gavilan Creek and one of its tributaries, Hospital Creek. Next slide, please. This image was taken during a 2015 flood event in the Car Lake Basin, where even under full agricultural development and channelization, it served as primary flood storage for the city of Salinas. The ecosystem services provided by the restored creek and floodplain areas on the Big Sur Land Trust property include expanding this flood capacity. Next slide, please. The project has had strong stakeholder and community support since inception. One result is this demonstration native plant community garden on a quarter acre of the Big Sur Land Trust property created a year after its purchase. The garden was planted and is maintained by community volunteers, local students, and neighbors. The fact that community-based restoration has already been initiated shows the awareness and support to expand nature-based recreation in this park for community. Next slide, please. This just shows uh, volunteers. Over 500 volunteers have contributed their time in helping to establish and maintain this native plant garden. Next slide, please. This is another example of the enduring community and educational support for the project. Big Sur Land Trust, in partnership with the Center for Community Advocacy, offer site tours of Car Lake to residents interested in learning more about the project and how they can be involved. From the multiple ecosystem service, community recreation, and educational benefits that the project would provide, staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed and allocate $776,000 of Proposition 40 funds. Rachel Saunders, Director of Conservation, and Beth Phoebus, Conservation Projects Manager from the Big Sur Land Trust, have joined the meeting to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. So board member questions, Damon. Thanks, John, and thanks, Kurt. Uh, this seems like a terrific project. 
I'm just curious, what's the, what are the plans for the rest of the, the property? It, does the rest of the 480 acres need to be uh, left as uh, in the status quo to continue to receive floodwaters or are there uh, plans for additional acquisitions? I'm just curious. Yeah, for the for that uh, first part of your question, I believe it still is in, under agricultural development. I don't quite know any future opportunities. Uh, does is uh, Rachel and Beth on the call to address that part of the question? Yeah, Rachel's here. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, and thanks for the question. Um, great question. So, uh, there are the rest of Car Lake is owned by two other property owners. Um, who are farming families uh, that have been farming the land since the 1950s. Um, and uh, we would love to do additional acquisition and work with the city to do that um, when those farming families are interested in doing that. Thank you, thank you Rachel. All right, any other board member questions? I had just a generic question. I out of curiosity, is, is this one of those uh, 125 um, um, severely depleted groundwater basins in this area? I don't know what the status is. Rachel, do you know? There's a, right now, there's a, uh, so the short answer is yes. Um, there's a Salinas Valley groundwater sustainability plan being developed. Um, and to the extent that we can enhance uh, groundwater, um, the infiltration of water into the ground as part of our project, we certainly will, that's a co-benefit. Um, and there are, I think, like six different plans that are subset of that larger uh, groundwater sustainability plan. And we've been in conversation with uh, that agency as well. Uh Thank you for that, because I was uh, wondering if that would also help replenish the supply by having the spreading basins on top of the groundwater basin. I authored SIGMA, the Groundwater Management Act, so uh, I thought that was one of these, these areas, and I want to make sure this was uh, a complementary program to um, that loss of uh, natural resource, so thank you. Thank you, Senator. Any other questions from board members or comments? All right, any public comments? No public comments, seeing none. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much. We'll move on to item number 30 uh, in the agenda, the Atia Ranch Conservation Easement in San Luis Obispo County. Uh, Brian Gibson on our staff will present the project. Thank you, John. Atia Ranch is an approximately 7,700 acre property, which is located near the westerly end of Lake Nacimiento, extending south from Monterey County, about 20 air miles northwest of Paso Robles in San Luis Obispo County. Most of the westerly boundary of Atia Ranch borders the uh, Hearst Ranch and connects to a wildlife corridor that extends through the Silver Peak Wilderness in Monterey County and throughout the Nacimiento River watershed. From north to south, the ranch is approximately five miles in length. Next slide, please. Atia Ranch provides extensive high quality habitat for wildlife, residing in and migrating through the region and connects six designated wildlife areas. Habitats present on the property include coast oak, uh, oak woodland, annual grasslands, extensive riparian, and chaparral. These habitats support several important animal species, including deer, golden eagle, and mountain lion. Next slide, please. The ranch's terrain reflects a wide variety of landforms, including scattered open meadows and pastures. Currently, the ranch is used for cattle grazing and wildlife habitat. Next slide, please. Protection of the Tia Ranch will also add to the landscape protection of the Nacimiento uh, watershed. A key, a key distinguishing feature of the ranch is the extensive frontage on both sides of Nacimiento River, which meander, meanders through the center of the ranch for a distance of roughly six miles. Next slide, please. The Nacimiento River supplies as much as 62% of the water in the Salinas River watershed annually, and the Atia Ranch plays a significant role in maintaining water quality and supply within Nacimiento River and Reservoir. Next slide, please. 
The grant agreement requires the Land Conservancy of San Luis Obispo County to monitor the property at least once a year to ensure the easement's terms are being honored, as well as prepare and submit a written monitoring report documenting the visit and noting any significant changes to the resources or any compliance issues. Staff recommends the WCB approve this project as proposed and authorize staff to enter into appropriate agreements necessary to accomplish the project. Uh, attending today's meeting is Kyle Walsh. He is the conservation director with the Land Conservancy of San Luis Obispo County. Thank you. Great, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Any board member questions, comments? One question, please. Yes. Uh, does that report annual report on the managing of the conservation easement between the rangeland and the naturally protected land um, get reported to the WCB for review each year? Yes, yes. it does. Okay, yep. thank you. That's a requirement in our grant agreements that they report annually. And then also in our grant agreement, we have the opportunity to go out with the grantees every third year to do our own monitoring on the ground and assess and compare with what has been reported to what actually is occurring on the ground. And uh, yeah, so, perfect. I was wondering uh, if that involved yeah. ever some on-site visits and yes. things, especially if it's it part does. of the 3030 plan. Right, yeah, it's been a little tough this last year and a half because of COVID. So we've kind of had to uh, stay our monitoring process, but before the COVID hit, staff was going out, uh, we were monitoring probably 100 to 120 projects a year. Uh, we were doing a really, uh, really awesome job. So we hope to kick that off in earnest again next year when the COVID restrictions are a little less restrictive on travel, uh, as well as you know the acceptance of the landowners and that kind of thing out meeting with folks on the ground. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other board member questions? Any public comment? I see one hand raised. Uh, All right, this is, um, this is Kyle Walsh, Conservation Director with the Land Conservancy of San Luis Obispo County. Just want to take a moment to thank Wildlife Conservation Board for considering funding this project. Um, when it's complete, this will be the Land Conservancy's largest single protected area in the county. Um, and it's been a very long time coming uh, with these landowners and uh, pursuing what for us is um, certainly a legacy project for our county, given its location um, and the impact um, it can have on a variety of conservation resources. So just wanted to take a brief moment to say thank you um, to all of the staff and to the board for considering the project. Great, thank you, Kyle. Any other more, any more public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item number 31. This is the SESB Siena Ecological Reserve Wetland and Riparian Restoration Project down in uh, Ventura County. James Croft of our staff will present the board, the project. James, take it away. Thank you, John. This project was selected to be presented to the board for funding consideration from the 2020 Pacific Flyway Conservation Solicitation. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Regents of the University of California, Santa Barbara for a cooperative project with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to enhance wetland and riparian habitat for the benefit of migratory birds within the Cienega Springs Ecological Reserve. The Cienega Springs Ecological Reserve is located at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Cienega Springs Ecological uh, Sorry, excuse me, it's located adjacent to the Fillmore Fish Hatchery in Fillmore within Ventura County. Next slide, please. The Cienega Springs Ecological Reserve was historically an extensive wetland complex that supported lush riparian woodland and freshwater marshes, as well as hundreds of migratory, wintering, and resident bird species. Over the past century, various land uses transformed this area into its current heavily altered state, and the birds, including federally and state protected species, have declined. Next slide, please. The Ecological Reserve was established at this location to restore and to protect this vital Southern California ecosystem. With a previous Proposition 1 grant from WCB, a rundo cover has been reduced from near 100% in most areas to less than 1% across the site. So the next phase of revegetation can, can occur concurrently as weed treatments wind down. Next slide, please. 
The project will restore willow cottonwood riparian woodland, emergent freshwater marsh, and patches of riparian and coastal sage scrub on a total of 20 acres where arundo removal has been completed and where minimal grading will be needed before planting. Restoration actions will include active and passive methods to reestablish and enhance riparian and wetland habitat. Next slide, please. Project activities include collecting and growing a diversity of na native riparian species and genotypes to promote climate resiliency and drought tolerance, soil preparation to facilitate plant establishment, reducing competitive weed populations, and vegetation installation and maintenance, according to the restoration plan. Vegetation and wildlife responses, especially emphasizing bird species, will be monitored throughout the project period and for at least two decades afterward to guide adaptive management and assess progress toward project watershed conservation goals. Next slide, please. Weed management will employ an integrated pest management approach using a variety of biological, mechanical, and chemical methods with an emphasis on practices that reduce the quantity and or concentration of herbicides used during project implementation. Primary weed control methods include removal by hand pulling, hand tools, or mowing. However, several weed species within the project area require herbicide treatments as the only effective method of control. Examples are giant reed, larger tamarisk trees, most large invasive trees, and larger perennial plants with well-established root systems. These plants respout readily from roots or rhizomes, which require that the root system be killed with herbicides to achieve control. Implementation will include cut and daub as much as possible, which is a technique to reduce herbicide use by applying herbicide directly to a cut stem or stump, rather than spraying whole plants. For several annual species, such as invasive grasses and mustards, a mix of mechanical methods and herbicides will be used to achieve control. Herbicide applications will include the use of amazapyr, chlorosulfuron, and or glyphosate following the CDFW IPM recommendations for the site. Next slide, please. The restored project area will provide important breeding and wintering habitat for migrant land birds and will also serve as a climate change refugium through the planting of drought, high temperature, and flood resilient riparian plant species. The target breeding bird species in this project include ones that have been monitored on the property already. Least Bells Vario, Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, and Western Yellow Billed Cuckoo will all benefit from this project. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. On Zoom today to answer any questions you may have is Adam Lambert, associate, associate researcher from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and Krista Hoffman, IPM coordinator for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you. Great, thank you, James. Any board member questions? Catherine. Yeah, and, and this might be for Krista. Um, since I think you're, in, your pre in the presentation just now, it was indicated that for figuring out which um, pest herbicides will be used, it will be, there will be consultation to figure that out. How do you make the distinction? I mean, how do you decide whether you're going to use imazapyr or um, glyphosate or the third um, pesticide that was mentioned? I'd like to uh, ask Adam Lambert to respond. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, Adam's uh, research there at Santa Barbara is uniquely positioned to answer this question for you. Sure, yes, thank you. Can you all hear me? Hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I just wanted to note that I am a researcher here at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and I'm an entomologist and I specialize in non-chemical methods, specifically biocontrol uh, as a means of controlling non-native invasive plants and insects. And so to answer your correct question, um, first I wanna state that we do emphasize non-chemical control as much as possible, uh, but to select methods, it's really based on a whole range of biological, either the physiological state of the plant, but also phenology of plant, biological resources in the area. Um, and essentially least effects of the herbicides or any other particular um, approach that we're using. Um, and one thing I wanna note as well is that um, I do follow uh, the literature on the effects of herbicides on pollinators closely because another area of emphasis emphasis of mine is insect conservation as well, especially of rare and endangered insects. 
Um, but glyphosate has received uh, the majority of the emphasis, um, particularly because of its um, publicity, um, but, but also because of its use. It is the mostly widely used pesticide uh, in the world. But all of the other insecticides or even herbicides we're using also pose risks as well. Uh, and fortunately, they haven't been studied. So just because uh, an insecticide or a herbicide has not been studied does not necessarily mean it does not pose a risk to pollinators or any other organism. So that's an important point to make. Um, and in the terms of imazapir, which again is an important herbicide and we've been moving away from glyphosate and more so using imazapir, um, that particular herbicide has a long residual, which is beneficial from a weed prevention standpoint, but it's also in the soil longer. Fortunately, we don't really know what impacts those are going to have on pollinators either. So our approach generally is to limit herbicide use overall as much as possible. Uh, but some of those, for example, um, Lepidium, which is perennial pepperweed, the reason we'd select that particular herbicide that was mentioned, chlorosulfuron, is because it's been shown to be effective. It's a very selective herbicide. Um, no other herbicides work on Lepidium. We've tried glyphosate. Uh, a mix of glyphosate and imazapir, and it doesn't kill it. The only thing that does is chlorosulfuron. So it really depends on the weed, um, the state of the weed and things like that, and on how we select any particular approach to what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. All right, any other board member questions? All right. Any public other public comment? So just to be clear, Catherine, would you like to take this off consent? I mean off consent, off the and have it voted on directly, or would you like to just keep moving forward and have it considered as, as the omnis? You know, I think we can keep moving forward because I think in in some respects, this is a poster child for what uh, applicants should be doing in terms of um, taking into consideration all of the tools uh, for controlling with an eye towards reducing as much as possible their herbicide use, if I understand um, uh, Adam correctly. And um, I mean, as I was listening to you speak, Adam, I was thinking it's probably, uh, you could probably be a resource to the WCB staff as they develop guidelines to ensure that we're getting projects that rely less on um, sort of the standard herbicides and also um, figure out ways of providing incentives to encourage uh, innovative and smarter approaches to reduce the impacts on pollinators. Great, thank you. Krista. Well, there is another hand up. Yeah, Krista. Yeah. Hi, yeah, this is uh, Krista Hoffman. I'm the uh, department's pest control advisor. Um, and I appreciate um, you allowing me to speak on the topic as well. I just wanted to mention that one of the other differences um, to be considered with the use of glyphosate um, and other chemicals, of course, is uh, the formulations that are used. So there's a, a real big difference between um, certain uh, different glyphosate formulations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, some of them are aquatic um, certified, so they're certified for aquatic use. And those formulations do not uh, contain different uh, inactive ingredients within the formulation. Uh, and a lot of studies have uh, shown there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence out there that it's the inactive ingredients in the formulations of glyphosate that are toxic to a lot of the non-target species that we're interested in, including pollinators. Um, so that's something that should, should be considered. Um, and I, I concur with Adam's statement that glyphosate is one of the most widely studied chemicals out there because of its broad, broad scale use. And, um, and therefore, you know, impacts have been determined. Uh, however, if you look at comparative toxicity between glyphosate and some of the other ing active ingredients out there, um, it's, it's, it's actually one of the safer um, active ingredients. Um, it's really the formulations that are the problem. 
So um, I would, I would, I definitely, um, I'm always a proponent for using the, the formulations that do not contain those toxic ingredients. So um, one of them is POEA, you might have heard of it. It's polyethoxylated taloamine. Um, and there are some other, you know, non-active ingredients and formulations. So that's something that, that could definitely be considered as we develop, you know, guidance for how to safely use um, glyphosate formulations and other herbicides, you know, that are effective. Um, so I just want to bring that up. My background is in toxicology. I have a PhD at UC Davis in environmental toxicology, and I specifically studied the non-target effects of herbicides and other um, insecticides on uh, aquatic invertebrates and fish. So it's something I'm very interested in myself. And um, yeah, I, I welcome you know um, your consideration of that that topic. Great, thank you, Krista. And I know staff has been talking with you already and kind of figuring out how we go forward even before this meeting. So I just yeah. want to say thank you for your support and your help going forward and looking forward to continuing this discussion and working with you to, to hopefully resolve this and uh, move forward. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I look forward to that too. All right, any other questions from board members? All right, All right, John, Chuck, just uh, you're doing great. Um, this takes us to 32. I think we have 38 or 39 and we're at 345. Yeah, I think we're looking good. So, yep. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, moving on to item number 32, the West Coyote Hills project in Orange County. This is an acquisition project with the city of Fullerton, as well as the State Coastal Conservancy uh, and US Fish and Wildlife Service. Daniel Vasquez on our staff will present the project to the board. Daniel. Thank you, John. <clears throat> this proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the city of Fullerton for a cooperative project with the Coastal Conservancy and the US Fish and Wildlife Service to acquire 10 acres of land for the protection of open space resources with, with wildlife habitat, wildlife corridors, and endangered species, including the California gnat catcher, and, for, and to provide uh, future wildlife oriented public use opportunities. The property known as West Coyote Hills, is, uh, neighborhood one, uh, is located west of Euclid Street in the city of Fullerton. It is part of a 510 acre tract of land, the largest remaining tract of undeveloped land in North Orange County. Next slide, please. Uh, this map shows the property specifically, uh, and uh, in, the, in this map you can also see uh, parcel one in relation to the 510 acre tract. Uh, parcel one is the you know, equivalent of a uh, neighborhood one. As you can see, there are nine approved neighborhoods. Uh, uh, they are all currently undeveloped. Uh, Coastal Conservancy is in the process of approving funding for the city's acquisition of neighborhood three, uh, shown here as parcel three. Uh, that should occur uh, next month. Next slide, please. The property is irregular shaped and vacant with limited frontage along Euclid, Euclid Street. It also has no direct access from Euclid Street and currently it is accessible via a private dirt access road that was originally used for oil operations. Um, this property was part of the West Coyote Hills, uh, made, uh, a, a major oil field that ceased oil production in the 1970s. Next slide, please. The property's topography is rolling to sloping hillside, and its vegetation includes coastal sage scrub, cluster tarweed, elderberry woodland, southern cactus scrub, and chaparral. Uh, the property supports habitat for the federally threatened coastal California gnat catcher and sensitive coastal cactus wren. In 2015, the city approved a vesting tentative tract map that allows for the subdivision of the 510 acre tract into 775 lots. Uh, the conditions of approval for this track map include require the inclusion of an interpretive nature center for research and outdoor education, and that the majority of the 510 acre tract would be preserved as public open space, including a trail and vista point system compatible with the adjacent open space. The city was given the option to purchase additional areas, including the property, for the inclusion in the Robert E. Ward Nature Preserve. Next slide, please. The property is located within the Central Coast Orange County NCCP ACP. This NC, NCCP ACP focuses on creating a multiple species, multiple habit 
sub-regional reserve system and implementing a long-term adaptive, adaptive management program that will protect the coastal sage scrub and other habitats and species within the coastal scrub, sage scrub habitat mosaic while providing for economic uses that will meet the so, social and economic needs of the communities within the sub-region. Next slide, please. The combination of this project with the, with the Coastal Conservancy project will eliminate all proposed residential development east of North Gilbert Street, resulting in the protection of open space and habitat, restoration of urban watershed health, and facilitating environmental education and stewardship. Following approval of this acquisition, the owner will construct and dedicate to the city the, north neighbor, the, the neighborhood trails and key vista improvements. The owner will also provide approximately two, uh, $3.8 million to the city for an endowment for habitat management, perpetual maintenance, protection of coastal sage scrub and, wet, and wetland habitats, and to operate, maintain, repair, and secure open space dedication areas, trails, key vista parks, and an interpretive center. In addition to the grant to the city, WCB will also accept a deed restriction that will require the property be owned and managed for open space, habitat, wildlife compatible public uses, and other, other resource related purposes. Staff recommends approval of this project as proposed. Um, uh, in the audience, we also have Alice Loyal with the city of uh, Fullerton and Mary Beth Wolf representing US Fish and Wildlife Services. Thank you. Great, thank you, Daniel. Any board member questions? All right, seeing none, any members of the public wishing to speak? Alice. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Alice Loy. I'm the deputy director of Parks and Recreation for the city of Fullerton. And I just want to thank you for considering the acquisition of West Coyote Hills. It's a very important open space project for the city of Fullerton and for North Orange County. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great, thank you. All right, any other public comment? Damon. Thank you for bringing this project. Uh, it's a great project. I've uh, known about it for a while. I, I grew up in North Orange County, so uh, I know where this place is. I've toured the site. I want to thank the city of Fullerton for stepping up. And um, although I think the application says, you know, this is not a, a disadvantaged community, uh, this will be, uh, this is open space that will be um, accessible to uh, underserved communities in North Orange County. So I'm um, very excited about it. And uh, thank you for bringing it forward and um, really happy to be voting uh, yes later today. Great, thank you. Any other comments? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item number 33, the Buena Vista Lagoon Restoration Planning Project in San Diego County. Uh, Don Crocker on our staff will present the project to you, Don. Uh, great, thank you, John. <clears throat> this proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the San Diego Association of Governments for a planning project to provide initial designs and engineering studies necessary to enhance the biological function and recreational values of Buena Vista Lagoon by restoring tidal connectivity and addressing increased sedimentation, invasive veg vegetation encroachment, and degraded water quality. Uh, looking at this map, you see Buena Vista Lagoon is located in northern San Diego County and spans the boundary between the cities of Carlsbad and Oceanside. It covers approximately 240 acres and includes the Buena Vista Lagoon Ecological Reserve, which is owned and managed by CDFW. Next slide, please. The lagoon historically had a dynamic equilibrium between a tidal influenced saltwater system during dry conditions and a river influenced freshwater system during wet conditions. This balance created an ecosystem that was dominated by estuarine wetlands and mudflats. This all changed in 1940 when a, weir was, uh, when a weir was installed at the lagoon outlet that prevented saltwater from entering the lagoon and disrupted the normal sediment transport process, which caused increased sedimentation in the lagoon. These changes in the lagoon's hydrology led to the conversion of estuarine wetlands to a freshwater marsh and is now characterized by continuously expanding stands of dense cattails. Additional habitat degradation has been caused by runoff from adjacent roadways and sewage spills entering the lagoon. The combined effect of these stressors has reduced water quality in the lagoon to the point that it is currently identified as an impaired water body for bacteria, 
nutrients, and sedimentation on the state of California's list of impaired water bodies. Next slide, please. On this map, you can see how thorough the conversion to a freshwater wetland has been. The blue areas represent freshwater instead of the brackish water that was historically present in the lagoon, and the light green areas are freshwater marsh. The only remnants of the lagoon's original habitat are the few areas of dark green on the upper right of this map. This conversion process is ongoing and will continue changing the character of the lagoon until tidal influence is restored. A study of the lagoon found that absent intervention, the lagoon will become completely composed of freshwater marsh, grassy meadows, and riparian oak woodlands, possibly as early as the year 2030. Next slide, please. In these two pictures, you can see how cattails have come to dominate the lagoon. And while the cattails are clearly the big issue, the bottom picture shows that other invasive plant species have moved into the lagoon such as the Canary Island fan palm in the foreground and the eucalyptus trees in the background. This habitat conversion has reduced co coastal habitat biodiversity and eliminated coastal wetland functions, which has increased pressure on a wide range of federally or state listed species. 10 sensitive plant species are known to have potential to occur within the lagoon, but only one, the Southwestern spiny rush is still within the lagoon. There are even more wildlife species that have been impacted by the conversion with 114 special status wildlife species having the potential to occur on site, but only 29 of these species are considered resident or breeding season visitors. Next slide, please. Efforts to restore the lagoon began several years ago and resulted in the development of three restoration alternatives that were considered and evaluated in an equal level of detail in an environmental impact review. After an extensive public review stage, the saltwater and hybrid alternatives were combined to create, create the preferred alternative, the modified saltwater, modified saltwater alternative. The MSA will result in a saltwater regime which will allow saltwater to enter the lagoon from an open tidal inlet during flood tides, while freshwater will enter the lagoon from upstream and along the boundary of the lagoon. The restoration of tidal influence will be accompanied by the removal of habitats that the current freshwater hydrology has allowed to move into and dominate the project area. These areas will be replaced by coastal lagoon habitats, including open water, mud flats, and southern coastal salt marsh. And you can see examples of these habitat in the pictures to the right. And the project will also include small areas of riparian and upland enhancement along the edges of the lagoon. Next slide, please. Here's a map of the new habitats that will result from the implementation, implementing the MSA. The open water element is now tidally influenced and brackish instead of freshwater. The freshwater marsh is gone and replaced by non-tidal, high, mid, and low saltwater marsh, which are represented by the various shades of green here. The brown areas represent mudflats, which are an important component of several sensitive species life cycles and are currently completely absent from the lagoon. There are also much smaller areas of riparian enhancement in yellow and coastal sage scrub in purple. Next slide, please. When fully implemented, this plan will enhance and maintain sensitive habitats and native species by restoring a system of native wetland and terrestrial vegetation communities that can be sustained. The project will also improve water quality, reduce disease concerns by mini minimizing potential mosquito breeding habitat, improve flood management, enhance public access and recreation opportunities, and assist with, the, assist with adaptation to climate change by allowing the wetland to migrate as sea level rise occurs. Therefore, staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. In the audience is Kim Smith from the San Diego Association of Governments. Thank you. Great, thank you, Don. Are there any board member questions? Damon. Your presentation, thank you, Don. Um, I, I would, just as a new member, I have a, a general question that com comes up in this particular uh, project. Uh, when there's a planning grant or planning process, um, uh, how much, well, first of all, sh you know, should we understand sort of how much then later the actual project is going to cost and how much funding is going to be needed to actually uh, implement and do the work? Um, what are the chances of that um, being funded then by WCB's uh, uh, sources of funding or, or other sources um, and should that weigh into our um, you know, you know uh, decision making we're obviously guided by staff and um, you know the vast majority of the time if you recommend it you know we should uh, I'm, I'm going to be that's going to carry a lot of weight but um, how does the sort of you know um, how much are we going to need later to actually carry out the plans that are made uh, by uh, this uh, 
that, that result from this funding, um, how should that weigh into our decision here? Uh, so right now it's, it's impossible to, you know, we can only do broad estimates of what the actual implementation might cost. Um, typically, the, the, on a project like this, there's something called a basis of design report, which is where you get your first estimates of the sort of cost of implement, implementing. And a basis of design is sort of synonymous with a 30% design level, which is what this project is paying for. So we were, we're not at the point where we can give a real good detailed guess. I mean, Kim Smith from Sandag might have an estimate of what they think it is, but we were right. really in the process right now of trying to figure out what this will cost long-term. Right. We're not, not quite there. This is, this is a big project, a very expensive project, and there's at least one or two more planning grants that are gonna be necessary after this before we even get to implementation. So a lot of those questions aren't really answerable at this point in time. It's, they're really just trying to work out the engineering and the real rough outline of what this major project will be. So uh, we, we will get to the point where we answer your questions, but it's, it's just not gonna be, when this grant's done, we'll be able to answer it. Um, Jamie, you wanna say Damon, something? Yeah, Damon, let me, let me answer it a different way. And I think it's a, it's a smart question from a, like a fiscal prudency as a board member question. So here, here's my experience, and this is especially true like in the coastal zone and in the part of the coastal zone that's you know, more urban than rural. Uh, coastal wetlands can, rep projects can be pretty expensive at the end of the day. And most of the ones I'm involved in, the department's involved in, even the WCB's involved in, the final funding is a, a matching funder. No one funder really anymore could carry the full weight. So what you'll also see happening at this moment is different funders may be taking certain parts of planning and permitting. And that all is a kind of, you know, raised by a village approach. And then you get to the final project, final design, and the, the, the different funders are thinking about contributions, you know, a share. So what you'll see a lot is John and staff and our institution at the board working really close with the Coastal Conservancy, um, you know, the federal government. And that tends to be the broad strategy I see play out on these coastal lagoon restoration projects. Uh, I think, Damon, the other concern to just keep in mind is if you're in for a penny, you know, you start to build an expectation in the grantee world that you're in for a pound at the end of the day. And, you know, I, that, that's a little bit, I think, the, behind your question as well. John, you want to weigh in from there? Yeah, no, I think you answered it. Great check. So did Don. But, you know, it will help us. It will inform what's going to be needed. And then we can prescribe from that what it may cost. And then we can go out and try to find not only WCB money, but also other funding. As Chuck said, mentioned, it's, it's, it takes a village to do these big restoration projects, particularly along the coast. You know, you have a lot of environmental work that needs to be done, a lot of engineering that needs to be done. You've got uh, potential not necessarily flood impacts, but you have to consider the raising water to adjacent neighbors, those kinds of things. And the local jurisdictions are really important in that kind of planning as well. Uh, you know, our goal is to do enough planning to get us to a shovel ready project at the time, because we really can't commit to a future project because we can't commute future state funds to a project. Uh, we can only plan up to that and have an idea of what it's gonna cost us to get to that end point. You know, and have the foundation, a really solid foundation, which part of our, this planning will do to help us get there. And a lot of times, Coastal Conservancy, WCB, Fish and Wildlife, you know, we, we, we chunk off different parts of a larger project and we pay for all of it. So this planning is WCB's part in that planning process. You're, you're, you're probably going to have Coastal Conservancy engaged in another aspect of the project. But then when you combine them at the end at the whole, we have a shovel ready project and then we could all fund the project in the end, hopefully if we have the funding. So that's kind of the way we do these big restoration projects, not only on the coast, but inland as well, because uh, they're expensive and they take a lot of time to do and they, they take a lot of funding to come together from a lot of different sources to bring the project to, to fruition and to conclusion. Super helpful, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Catherine. 
Yeah, th th thanks, John. That was a really good explanation. And it makes me wonder then, conversely, we aren't committed to providing additional funds in the future for this project. We are only committing with this to help with the planning. And I, I bring that up because, you know, we do have a changing um, or evolving goals. And there are a lot of goals to start looking at other communities to consider equity um, in what we fund in the future. So some of the projects that we've been planning for wouldn't fall into that category. And I just want to make sure that any of anybody who's part of an equity community or an environmental justice community or disadvantaged community that's looking at where can they go for funding recognizes that we are still someplace they should be looking. It's not that our future funding is all locked in. Very much so. That's a great point, Catherine. Thank you. All right, any other comments from board members? I do have some speaker cards for this particular project and I'd like to call those out, so be prepared. So first we'll call Mayor Esther Sanchez with the city of Oceanside and then following Esther will be Mayor Matt Hall with the city of Carlsbad. So Esther. Thank you, good afternoon. I'm Mayor Esther Sanchez representing the city of Oceanside. I'm also the chair of the Buena Vista Lagoon Joint Powers Authority. Thank you so very much for including our project on your agenda today. We are so very excited to be before the WCB on the Buena Vista Lagoon uh, restoration planning project. Um, 20 years ago, it's been 20 years, I had every hope that we would be able to move forward on this critical project during my lifetime on the city council. So I've been, here, I've been around for a while, um, sometimes assisting and sometimes really leading the restoration conservation effort of the Buena Vista Lagoon. We have worked against development proposals that would have negatively impacted the, the lagoon. We are very fortunate that our cities of Oceanside and Carlsbad were able to work through SANDAG, our regional government board, to bring the environmental studies to fruition, approval, and sign off by local residents. It was truly a heroic feat by Keith Greer and Kim Smith of SANDAG. And we look forward to working with the WCB as we move forward through engineering work to make this project shovel ready. We are so very honored, grateful, and excited for the recommendation to award this project $3 million, which represents half of the total funds we believe we will need to get this project shovel ready. This $3 million allows us to begin the engineering design work and at the same time use these funds as leverage to obtain the balance of the $3 million. We believe we will be able to do that within a short period of time as we see this as a high priority project. Again, thank you so very much for the opportunity to be before you and for your phenomenal support in protecting this very critical habitat and addressing uh, significant water quality issues. Great, and as to, um, we do believe that this would, I was on the Co Coastal Commission and we had some discussions about this uh, um, potential project and um, this would have gone, uh, gotten, um, you know, pretty high on a public works prod, uh, um, list and we see a very real potential as um, using or getting funding through mitigation projects. Thank you. Great, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mayor Matt Hall, city of Carlsbad. Yes, uh, and I just wanna echo everything that uh, Mayor Sanchez has said. And I think the question about future funding was absolutely a perfect question. And I would only offer up the Batagitas Lagoon, which is to the lagoon south of this, two lagoons south of this. And several years ago, we started down the same path and we were, we were just trying to get the first steps done. And we no sooner got it to the go position when I think it was the Long Beach Harbor needed mitigation credits and stepped in and wrote the whole check. Um, so, uh, and again, like Esther, I've been on this, the part of this JPA off and on since the mid nineties. So we both have a history of trying to get this across the finish line and your help and your support today will mean a whole lot to us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Diane Nygaard. Diane. Nygaard? You hear me? Yes. Okay. Diane Nygaard representing Preserve Calavera. 
Um, we're part of that village who very much wants to see this project get completed. We've all been watching this lagoon slowly die for many, many years. And it's taken many miracles to get this restoration plan this far along. And so today we're really asking you to take the next step towards that effort and become part of the miracle to bringing it to the finish line. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Dan. Uh, Natalie Shapiro. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, I'm Natalie Shapiro, Executive Director of the Buena Vista Audubon Society, a nonprofit charitable organization in Oceanside, California, located directly adjacent to the Buena Vista Lagoon. So our, or, our organization's history with the lagoon spans almost 70 years since our formation in the 1950s. Given our proximity to the lagoon, we are very aware of the rapidly deteriorating state of the lagoon due to the weir at the mouth blocking tidal flows. Since the first efforts at a restoration plan, plan began in the early 2000s, we have been involved educating our members and visitors to our nature center to support removing the weir and creating a saltwater estuary. Our organization strongly supports staff recommendations for the project for the following reasons. It would maximize species diversity and protection of threatened and endangered species that greatly improve water quality by allowing tidal exchange, which would have a very positive public health and safety benefit, along with re reducing mosquito populations because salt water isn't so conducive to mosquitoes. And then a very um, a positive impact on curtailing the growth of cattails, thus reducing maintenance costs. So um, once again, we support staff recommendations and thank you for the time for speaking. Great, thank you, Natalie. All right, any other public comments? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to item number 34, the Del Mar Mesa Habitat Restoration Project in San Diego County. Kurt Malchow will also provide the board with a presentation on this. Kurt. Thank you, John. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Chaparral Lands Conservancy for a cooperative project with the City of San Diego to restore and enhance five acres of vernal pool wetlands and adjacent upland vegetation on the Del Mar Mesa Preserve in San Diego County. Next slide, please. The Del Mar Mesa Preserve is the overarching name of an 814-acre area of consolidated conserved lands, mostly owned and managed by the city of San Diego, but also includes properties owned by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and US Fish and Wildlife Service. The project helps to implement the 1997 San Diego Multiple Species Conservation Plan and Vernal Pool Habitat Conservation Plan, which goals include providing an effective framework to protect, enhance, and restore vernal pool resources in specific areas within the city of San Diego's jurisdiction. And next slide, please. The Del Mar Mesa Preserve is home to dozens of endangered and threatened species of plants and animals unique to San Diego and supports some of the last best vernal pool habitat in Southern California. The preserve is also a popular recreational destination for equestrians, trail bike riders, naturalists, and hikers. Next slide, please. Off-road vehicle use was common at the site until completion of the preserve and damage is concentrated around a now closed dirt road where vehicle use eroded or trenched vernal pools and crushed upland vegetation. The Del Mar Mesa Preserve is now secure against off-road vehicle use, but repair of significant residual damage is necessary. These images show dirt roads that were formed over vernal pool areas have since been closed, yet the damage remains. These would be graded to match the original natural terrain with a restructuring of vernal pools where they once existed. Native chaparral would also be planted and seeded to match adjacent upland native vegetation. Next slide, please. Some of these areas have more serious damage from tire trenching. Here, careful earthwork will be done with hand tools to restore natural vernal pool contours. Next slide. These images show fencing that was installed along the earliest properties that were conserved to protect these areas from development, which at that time surrounded the small preserve. Today, those surrounding properties are now part of the preserve, making these fences a barrier for wildlife movement. These fences would be removed to facilitate open wildlife movement throughout the preserve instead of intermittent deer trails poked through the existing damaged fence lines on opposite ends of the project area. Next slide, please. 
Along the remaining utility access roads and active recreational trails, however, fence lines are still needed to protect rental pools on limit usage and new construction of illegitimate trails. Installation of post and cable fencing with the design shown here would accomplish this while still allowing for wildlife passage. Next slide, please. Illegitimate trails such as this will be fenced off and planted to remove their appearance as authorized trails. Next slide. The new fencing would also be located in a way that seeks to protect another resource on the preserve, cryptobiotic or hidden life soils. This is seen as the gray soil cover on the left side of these two images. Cryptobiotic soils have received less scientific and conservation attention, but nonetheless support an extraordinary biological community of primarily non-vascular plants such as blue-green algae, fungi, and bacteria that are adapted to California's Mediterranean climate and as easily as rare as vernal pool habitat. Next slide, please. Controlling invasive weeds that are visible here as the tanned, low fine grass around the perimeters of dry vernal pools will be a critical project component. In these areas, all weeding will be performed exclusively by hand or careful line trimming to prevent collateral harm from herbicide to aquatic plants and animals. Mechanical weed control will be important for project success. It is not practical to entirely replace usage of herbicide and are sometimes more harmful to resources than herbicide. In the case of this project, mechanical weeding would damage areas of mature or recovering sensitive cryptobiotic soil plant cover meant to be protected under the project. Herbicide, which is gly glyphosate here as well, will be applied during project weed control activities by licensed applicators following best management practices and under the supervision of a project biologist. Next slide, please. Listed in sensitive plants like the state and federally endangered San Diego button celery, sensitive orcas bordea, state and federally listed endangered San Diego mesa mint will be seeded in the repaired and constructed infernal pools on the project site. Once restored, the project area would increase the functionality and extent of vernal pools, as well as other habitat types, considered as one of the highest priority natural communities covered in regional and statewide conservation planning initiatives. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed and allocate $800,000 of Proposition 68 funding. David Hogan, Director of the Chaparral Lands Conservancy, has joined the meeting to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. All right, any board member questions? Catherine. Thanks, Jim. Um, so I have a couple of questions. One of them is, and this is sort of maybe more general, but I, this is $800,000 for how many acres are actually gonna be? I think, involved it's in? I think it's looking at the top here. Five, it's focused on five areas of vernal pool wetlands. So that's, that's a pretty high price per acre. And this may get to, I mean, what I hear from staff is Southern California projects cost a lot. Can you just give me a little bit of a sense about why this project would be so expensive per acre? Yeah, does the Conservancy want to take that question? Yeah, David, uh, if you could raise your hand, we could uh, locate you more quickly. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Uh, thanks. It's an incredible honor to be here today. And thanks, Catherine, for your question. Um, vernal pools are a complicated ecosystem uh, with a particular concentration of special status species. And added to that on this site is another unique ecosystem with a concentration of really rare species, the cryptobiotic soils that Kurt mentioned. It takes just extraordinary care and therefore high labor costs to work around those ecosystems. So we're doing these really specialized activities like collecting seed from these exact plants that you see on the slide, taking them to a nursery, bulking them, bringing them out to, to plant in the, the new vernal pools that we create, doing really strategic and sur uh, surgical grading in that old dirt road uh, that doesn't disturb the adjacent natural vegetation to re, uh, re, re, you know, restore the vernal pools that were in that road originally. Um, the weed control that I'll address in a, uh, another second with my comments. So all of these things, highly technical, highly labor intensive, and unfortunately, therefore the, the relatively high cost. And, and then on, um, 
weed control. Um, can you go into some detail about that, how you'll be able to avoid, um, mitigate or avoid uh, unnecessary um, impacts on pollinators? And, sure. and also weave into that, I, I'm curious about why cryptobiotic um, soils aren't, um, why aren't they harmed by, and, and the, the plants on those soils harmed by glyphosate or other herbicides? Sure. Um, so this is something we've looked at closely. Uh, glyphosate and herbicide use is a concern to me as much of, as many other enviros, uh, environmentalists. Um, the, you know, of course, any native plants can be impacted by glyphosate, um, just like non-native plants. So it's all a matter of, in, our, in the case of our projects, very strategic and limited application and timing of application, timing of the plant maturity, uh, and, and just making sure that we're not uh, overspraying into these areas that are sensitive, whether it's the vernal pools, uh, especially when they have water, uh, or in the cryptobiotic soils. So a couple of things I'll just raise that, you know, I've listened to the whole conversation today, just, uh, just to add to the additional information about herbicides in general, but also on this site, you know, we're only applying it when the weeds are immature, uh, but large enough to identify as weeds, but long before they mature flower and begin attracting pollinators. So we're trying to get them as early as possible in their life cycle. Uh, typically, basically anytime after it's rained. So that's usually starting in November or December, but can go well into spring, like even as late as May. Typically, we're not out there much past June or July. Um, and uh, most of that is for line trimming. But, you know, the, so the goal is to catch these weeds as, as young as possible when the smallest amount of herbicide is, you know, possible to use and before they, long before they flower. Um, we definitely considered alternatives to glyphosate, uh, but just like others have raised, um, those alternatives are less effective, require great amounts, greater amounts of herbicide, and they do leave more residue. Um, so we've, uh, the recommendations from our, our habitat restoration contractors have been to try and stick with glyphosate and just limit the concentrations and limit the application to the extent possible. Um, line trimming on the site is an option and we'll definitely be using it in some circumstances, especially closer, even hand weeding uh, closer to the vernal pools and thus some of the extra cost for this project. Um, line trimming will be employed for plants that are large enough to target with that method. But many of the weeds that we're going after are very small, like a rhodium, stork's bill it's called. Um, they're relatively small and not typically tall enough for control with line trimmers, and there's way too much of it to try and control by hand. So the lower the line trimmer to the ground, the greater the likelihood of damage to the delicate cryptobiotic soils, for example, sensitive plant species found in the cryptobiotic soil, and sensitive reptiles and amphibians, for example. And then, you know, just kind of a stepping back for a second with herbicide impacts on pollinators, you know, I do habitat restoration. I'm an active environmentalist. This is certainly a, a, a huge concern for us. Invasive non-native plant weeds are one of the greatest threats to you know, our special native biological diversity in California. Native pollinators are seriously threatened by the spread of plant weeds that outcompete and displace native host plants and food plants. And some pollinators like native bees even nest in the ground and are displaced when non-native grass weed thatch, for example, covers their preferred bare ground habitat. So it's really important to consider when we're talking about use of herbicides, we're looking for that balance between the limited collateral damage that may occur with herbicide contact with native pollinators under very limited circumstances versus the wholesale loss of native pollinator habitat um, from conversion of native habitats to weed lands or missed opportunities for restoration of native pollinator habitat that are only made possible with careful use of herbicides. Um, herbicide use on habitat projects isn't anything like, you know, what we see in the Central Valley uh, or Salinas Valleys with aerial spraying and, you know, broad scale application. Rather, they're highly limited, targeted, strategic, and really so important that they remain an available tool for weed control and protection of California's unique wildlife plants and ecosystems. So uh, thanks for your consideration with that. 
So you're not doing broadcast spraying, you're doing targeted spraying then? Yeah, it's very surgical. And in fact, some circumstances we're using these wands, they have a little sponge on the tip where you just barely touch the plant you know, directly where you're not even using a sprayer. We're definitely using sprayers in some circumstances, but the wands will be a major part of the project. Great, thank you, David. Damon. Yes, thanks, John. Um, I appreciate the ongoing conversation on, on herbicides. It's an important issue to me as well. Uh, I also really appreciated Catherine's question about uh, the you know cost uh, cost per acre uh, and the uh, perceived value of um, uh, you know what what's coming out of these projects. Um, and I really appreciated David's response. I thought uh, it makes a lot of sense um, from my my work in conservation. Uh, vernal pools are exceedingly rare and need to be protected uh, for all the reasons explained in the, the project application. And so I, I am strongly supportive of this uh, proposal. Uh, it's also flagging for me, though, that, you know, I've already I'm already bracing for, for example, 30 by when 30 by 30 hits, um, you know, there's going to be scrutiny on um, you know how much bang for the buck we're getting in terms of uh, acres protected, for example, and you know I I know that um, for example some areas uh, in Southern California um, the land prices are very high and that may get you less bang for your buck, um, and I hadn't even thought about uh, a, a vernal pool uh, habitat may be more labor intensive and require uh, more funding to do the restoration. That's another example of why you need more funding uh, for something that is um, extremely important from a conservation and biodiversity perspective. All the things that WCB and the department are supposed to be looking out for and central to 30 by 30, but that may not get communicated to, for example, the legislature and other folks who are mm -hmm minding the uh, the purse strings. So to the extent that we can, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure you are, you know, I, if, if you are great, I'd love to hear about it, you know, but if we are trying to get out ahead of that and start thinking about how to message that uh, to folks, uh, you know, it, it's not too early to start because 30 by 30 is, is coming and I can already anticipate we're gonna get those types of questions. Great, thank you, Damon. Do you mind if I added one more thing? Please. Um, vernal pool, <clears throat> excuse me, frog in my throat. Vernal pools in San Diego in particular, um, in something like 50 to 100 square feet, you can have seven to 10 either listed endangered or sensitive species. And then again, in that same size patch of habitat in the cryptobiotic soils, sensitive plant species, um, Never, none of which are listed yet, but yet, key, key emphasis on yet, they're very rare. And so you might have to go to 10 acres or 100 acres or even 500 acres of chaparral or coastal sage scrub to get that concentration of, of listed species. So big bang for your buck here. Hey, Damon. There you go. Is, yeah. Damon, this is Chuck. And I, I think it's an astute uh, advice. We make sure we communicate. And it's almost as if it's reduced to this dynamic, there's high value in rareness, right? Rareness generates cost. And particularly in this project, these vernal pools in the coastal arena, they're incredibly rare, right? So I do think part of the WCB's job is to anticipate what the future looks like and make sure we have the capacity to do what California needs to take care of these rare places and things. Well, I explain, you know, why it's in legislators' interest to uh, fund these projects, um, because they're going to need to explain to constituents as well. So we, yep. we should have those answers. And I, I think we will. And we just need to, um, you know, have compelling and persuasive reasons that we can put out there that folks can, can use and pass on to others. I totally agree. Thank you. All right. Any other board member comments? 
Any public comments? I have no speaker cards for this. You know, I'll just add my gratitude for your consideration of this project. It's David Hogan again. Um, Del Mar Mesa Preserve was the very first place I worked as an environmental activist to try and protect. Um, at the time, there was only that one little preserve with the fencing, less than 10 acres, that was a mitigation site for freeway construction. Uh, now it's nearly 900 acres in size, plus additional open space nearby. Uh, so it's enormously gratifying to come full circle. And that was 1987 when I started. First place I ever saw a rental pool. So to come back now in 2021 and to be pursuing habitat restoration projects here, incredible privilege and very gratified that you've considered this grant. Thank you. And just a point on that uh, point, WCV is a significant contributor to the acquisition of those lands along with Fish and Wildlife Service and others, but WCV played an important role and a significant role in the protection of those properties to begin with. So it's great seeing the restoration come on after the fact and doing great work continuing on. So just wanted to let the board know that. All right, moving on to item number 35, the Kendall Frost Field Station and Learning Center Enhancement Project in San Diego County. James of our staff, James Croft, will present the project to you, James. And just to check in with the board, we're about 425. We're moving great. I think we have two more projects to consider. Uh, and so we're, I think we're in good shape. And just please, board members, speak up to me if you have an issue or timing issue. Uh, I'd appreciate it so we can see where we are. So James. Thank you, John. Uh, we're gonna switch it up a little bit from the habitat restoration projects and uh, get into a facility enhancement project uh, that we're gonna be looking at under the University of California Natural Reserve System Grant Program that WCB here manages. Um, in a second infusion of funding first allocated to this program under Proposition 84, Proposition 68 provided up to $10 million uh, to the University of California Natural Reserve System for matching grants for the acquisition of land, construction, and development of research facilities to improve the management of natural lands, for preservation of California's wildlife resources, and to further research related to climate change. Next slide, please. The mission of the UC University of California Natural Reserve System is to contribute to the understanding and management of the earth and its natural systems by supporting university level teaching, research, and public service at protected areas throughout California. Uh, the reserve system has offered outdoor laboratories to field scientists and classrooms for students since 1965 and hosts over 100,000 users each year. Nine University of California campuses manage 41 reserves that cover over 47,000 acres and represent almost all of California's major habitat types. Next slide, please. Uh, the WCB uh, manages a grant program that provides funding through Proposition 68 uh, to the University uh, Reserve System. Uh, those eligible entities are those nine general campuses within the UC system. Uh, we've established a 25% match or cost share requirement that comes from the university. Uh, WCB, uh, we administer the solicitation and application process. Uh, while the University Reserve System administers the ranking and selection process, they also administer the process by which they um, allocate those dollars amongst the uh, nine general campuses. So we're gonna talk about a particular project that we're bringing to the board uh, under this uh, in this board meeting. Uh, next slide, please. All right. The Kendall Frost Field Station and Learning Center Enhancement Project was selected to be presented to the board for funding consideration from the University of California Natural Reserve System Grant Program. This proposal is to consider the allocation for a grant to the Regents of the University of California, San Diego for a project to complete facility enhancements at the Kendall Frost Field Station and Learning Center located in San Diego within San Diego County. The Kendall Frost Field Station and Learning Center is owned and operated by the Regents of the University of California, San Diego as a reserve within the University of California Natural Reserve System. Next slide, please. The field station is used extensively for research, education, and outreach, including use by the Wetlands Training Institute as a training location in the Army Corps of Engineers Wetlands Assessment Methods. The field station also hosts frequent volunteer activities for school groups, scouts, church groups, birding groups, and visitors from assisted living centers. 
A field station hosts an annual Love Your Wetlands Day, which attracts as many as 500 visitors who have a chance to walk in the marsh, pick up trash, and refurbish rail nests. There are nature-themed games for kids, booths with demonstrations, and participants can paddle a kayak or take a bird walk within the marsh. The current facility that supports these uses is a 50-year-old mobile trailer installed at the reserve in 1971. The trailer is not ADA compliant and does not include a public restroom. Portable restrooms are rented during periods of high use. Next slide, please. The outdoor facility includes two storage sheds, a narrow wooden deck, and a 20 foot by 30 foot shade structure. When weather permits, the shade structure serves as a, as a classroom for students and researchers. Next slide, please. The kitchen or slash workspace can hold at most eight people seated or, seated or 10 standing. There is a low counter space along the east wall used as a desk. The west wall includes a similar counter with a sink and both upper and lower cabinets. Next slide, please. This slide is just a picture of, the, of a modest researcher's office uh, that's there at the reserve. Next slide, please. The trailer houses the communications hub for the reserve computers, weather station, and nest cameras for four man-made man Ridgeways whale nesting platforms located in the marsh. The real nesting platforms are studied by researchers for three months of the year during rail breeding season. Next slide, please. The project will replace the existing trailer with a new ADA compliant prefabricated structure. The structure will include classroom space for students, a workspace for field researchers, an observation deck, storage space, restrooms, and space for overnight accommodations. The research section of the building will include private overnight accommodations to house visiting researchers. There will be two bedrooms, a bathroom, a small kitchen, and laundry facilities. The workroom will have tables and counters for workspace, a utility sink, cabinets, and a dedicated space for the communication equipment used to run the weather station and nest cameras. The southwest corner of this space will be furnished as an office. Next slide, please. The public part of the building will be furnished for education and outreach. This half of the building will include a bathroom, multi-purpose room large enough for a class of 30, reception area, and storage for tables and chairs. The multi-purpose room will have large roll-up windows that will open to a shaded viewing deck. The new facility will provide greater opportunities for research, restoration, and management, while providing an accessible space for students and visitors that will encourage stewardship of endangered salt marsh habitat. Staff recommends that the Wildlife Conservation Board approve this project as proposed. On Zoom today to answer any questions you may have is Ms. Heather Henter, Executive Director from the University of California, San Diego Natural Reserve System. Thank you. Thank you, James. Any board member questions? Damon. Great presentation, thank you. Um, sounds like a worthy project. I'm just wondering, so there isn't like a rendering of how big and what the new building will look like. Um, is it similar in size to the current trailer or the current um, storage shed or is it bigger? Can, can you sort of just summarize that? Yeah, sorry, we did have some, uh, some drawings that wouldn't, wouldn't fit. They did not orient it well for a PowerPoint presentation. It wouldn't really fit very well. It's a couple hundred square feet larger than the current footprint that sits here, um, but uh, will provide a much expanded and more functional uh, space for researchers, students, and whatnot. If Heather want, would like to talk uh, about uh, those upgrades, that would be great. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> Yes. Yep. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for um, presenting this project. Yeah, we're super excited about this building. Um, and the thing we're, I'll just say the thing we're most excited about, and that is that it's going to have this large multipurpose room, which James referred to, that can hold a class of, his, uh, of at least 30 students. Um, and that is something the old building absolutely cannot do. It's only the old building, it's it, the old trailer. It's just an old house trailer. And so it's got all these little rooms. So there's no place for really a class of students or a group of a community group or anything to gather inside the building. So that's what the new building will provide. And 
were we we were very careful to um, design the new building with a separate sort of the north part of the building is going to be the kind of research or private part of the building where all the expensive equipment can be locked away and can be secured all you know uh, valuable samples and everything and then this and then that's going to have a completely separate entrance on the south end of the building where this multi-purpose room will go that will be and so we'll be able to so the thing we're most excited about is that we we feel like it'll be our our ability to do community outreach will be really enhanced with this new building because we have the separate because it's we have a larger room one single room that can accommodate a group and because we can secure away the um the kind of the expensive or valuable uh research equipment in one part and then have the the public part um it's much will be much easier to have that um, accessible to the public. So whether it's, and we do, we work with uh, school kids a lot, uh, Mission Bay High School, which is, have, is a Title I high school, is, is kitty corner, literally from the marsh. And they, we've had a longstanding collaboration with them. Um, uh, and and uh, their Kendall Frost Marsh is the focus of their project-based learning for all of their ninth graders right now. Um, so so we have, you know, as, as James uh, mentioned, lots of different school groups coming, scout groups, religious groups, et cetera, et cetera. So having a room where they can actually um, congregate, stage their experiments, discuss their results, et cetera, et cetera, have an ADA bathroom um, will be incredibly valuable for us. And that's what we're most excited about is that, that it'll be, that the, our public interface will be so much enhanced. Great, thank you, Heather. That's great, thank you. I, um, you answered, you partly answered one of my questions. I um, saw in the application that the location is not within a disadvantaged community, but uh, you're speaking to, you're working with a uh, Title I school. That's really great. If there's anything else you can uh, say about your work with underserved communities and um, folks in low-income communities of color, great. Yeah, there are underserved. I don't have the map in front of me, but um, there are uh, uh, the area does uh, abut a number of underserved communities. Uh, yeah, so we work a lot with uh, Mission Bay High School. We also work, um, we collaborate a lot with um, uh, the San Diego Audubon Society, and they have a number of programs working with underserved um, uh, grade school kids. Um, uh, uh, um, and um, et cetera. Great, thank you. All right, any other board member questions? All right, seeing none, any members of the public wishing to speak? All right, seeing no hands raised, we'll move on to item number 36 in the agenda. This is a San Diego County MSCP Crest Lake acquisition project. Uh, Kurt Weber on our staff will present the project. Kurt. Thanks, John. The uh, Crest Lake property is near the town of Alpine in San Diego County, south of Interstate 8. Land in the area to the north and northwest is mountainous and fairly undeveloped. The 304 acre project is within the Alpine community plan which encompasses about 110 square miles near the Cleveland National Forest. Next slide. This acquisition will enhance the San Diego Multi-Species Conservation Plan. The MSCP addresses the potential impacts of urban growth, natural habitat loss, and species endangerment, and creates a plan to mitigate for the potential loss of covered species and their habitat due to the direct impacts of future development of both public and private lands within the MSCP area. Next slide. The property is adjacent to two other conserved properties totaling 138 acres that were funded by WCB and the US Fish and Wildlife Service in January of 2016. Much of the surrounding conservation lands were burned in 2003 and 2007 area fires. The property will provide habitat for population re and reoccupancy of wildlife species. The property contains coastal sage scrub habitat for the federally threatened coastal California gnat catcher, as well as habitat for other sensitive and protected species. Next slide. 
migration corridors between habitat areas will be protected and maintained to allow for range shifts and migration of species to utilize suitable habitat as necessitated by many factors, such as temporary loss of habitat due to the aforementioned fire or drought. Endangered Habitat Conservancy will conduct surveys and monitoring of plant and animal species, invasive species, and rare plants. Next slide. This data will be integrated into the regional NCCP management and monitoring program. EHC plans for possible future public use opportunities include hiking, photography, and bird watching. Here from EHC, uh, Today with us is Michael Beck, the Executive Director. Next slide. Thanks, John. Great, thank you, Kurt. All right, any board member questions? All right, seeing none, we do have one speaker card. Uh, Michael Beck, Executive Officer of the Endangered Habitats Conservancy, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for considering this project. It's a 15-year-long it's a -year haul to get to where we are today, so a lot of appreciation on our end, and, and thanks to Kurt as well. Um, this project has a very significant strategic value because it's connecting this large regional linkage that we've been working on for, I don't know, 15 years at least, and uh, many of those projects have been funded by uh, Section 6 and WCB funding. So there's, there's a lot of appreciation there. Uh, I also would like to take the opportunity to um, uh, express our really sincere appreciation for uh, John Walsh's work at WCB. He's been uh, kind of the, the epitome of a, of a professional, high quality public servant and I'm quite sure that anybody in our conservation world that's worked with John would say the same thing. So I wanted to uh, share the, our feelings about that. And then finally, on your on your bang for your buck topic that you were hitting on earlier, um, totally appropriate and fair question. And I I think it would be really important to integrate those projects that are implementing the NCCP because the NCCP itself as a comprehensive conservation and land use program has created extreme amounts of project streamlining and, and other economic benefits. Those analyses have been done. So uh, it, it's a factor that is worth, it's a box worth looking into as you're doing this economic development. And we, we certainly understand how expensive everything is in Southern California, but in many of these projects in Southern California, uh, they're implementing the state NCCP. And so that is kind of an integral component of that. Uh, maybe finally in the fairly crazy world we're in right now, it was really kind of a hopeful, it always is, but today in particular, for some reason, very hopeful presentation of projects that are really addressing these key uh, kind of ecosystem issues in the state of California. Very appreciative to the Wildlife Conservation Board for having that responsibility and carrying it out so well. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Catherine. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it might be helpful, John, if you or one of your staff um, explain why it's uh, identified as a severely disadvantaged community. When you look at these pictures, you don't see any people. Um, but, you know, based on what we were discussing the other day, I think it would be helpful. Okay, yeah, I'll, real quick. So there's a definition in the propositions that we have to use, and there's two classifications, either a disadvantaged community or a severely disadvantaged community. And the disadvantaged community, the definition is a community with a median household income less than 80% of the statewide average. And the severely disadvantaged community is income less than 60% of the statewide average. And those areas are mapped by the mapping scheme that we use is through the Department of Water Resources. And so those areas are mapped. And so if your project falls adjacent to one of those disadvantaged communities that are mapped, but it still serves a disadvantaged community, 
we can't really identify it as a disadvantaged community. So we're kind of at a at a disadvantage from using that kind of a map, but that's what we're required to use right now. Uh, but I think recognizing that most, if not all of these projects that you have seen today are either adjacent to or closely associated with both a severely disadvantaged community and a uh, disadvantaged community. So it's just the mapping configuration that we're that we use to identify those areas is kind of what is is identified in the agenda where where it says that we're either in a disadvantaged community or we're not. But you know, I think most of these projects, you know, they will serve disadvantaged communities from, you know, from Mexico border to the Oregon border to the coast to the to the eastern border of California. And uh, so that's kind of what we're, that's what we have to use now, Catherine. Yeah. Catherine, if I could add, this is Chuck, one, two things. And I'm, I'm super excited you and Damon are on the board. And it helps, I think, the board uh, for the next steps ahead of it that like our, our longer serving public members have really pushed for as well. Um, you know, John's describing some technical details around definitions and statutes. And I think a lot of times the public, I mean, just scratches its head when we refer to kind of technical statutory definitions. The fact of the matter is we need the board to set an expectation with folks that come to us for funds they have to draw a through line from the restoration they're doing into opening up access, access for all underserved community, all these other things that I think have been a part of our ethos, but now really we need to pull front and center throughout the power of our purse and help continue to move you know, our broad communities that direction. It's not to say, um, you know, lack of, you know, access or uh, opportunity for underserved committees means we don't want to see the project as much as it is to say, please communities out there start thinking about us as an asset to advance in this arena as well. Thank you, Chuck. So any, I see Michael Beck has his hand up again. Yeah, I, I'd just like to, number one, um, appreciate the question and, and the point that's being made about underserved communities and and let the board know that we're kind of joined at the hip with the Earth Discovery Institute environmental education uh, group that you heard earlier today and they run uh, environmental education programs on on many of our properties and these are I think exclusively underserved communities in San Diego referred to the south of eight communities four or five different school districts. And that's the focus of their work. Uh, very multicultural, very, uh, very energized by getting into these open spaces and, and getting on the ground experience of, uh, of kind of the science and the, and the other disciplines within the educational programs in their schools. And that includes their teaching staff and others. So we're very well integrated into the, uh, the school, the elementary school districts in, in that part of San Diego County with many of our project areas. Thank you, Michael. Dan, we, so I was just gonna prompt whether we're ready for the omnibus motion of all omnibuses. Not yet, we have one more quick item, item number 37. Yeah, but is, oh, we need to approve a resolution. Yeah, Got, it. Need, uh, yeah. approve a resolution. Got it. Got it. So there's actually two resolutions to approve: one for Diane Colborn and Mary, one for Mary Creesman, who has termed off. They termed off this year, and uh, fortunately, you know, they served the board very well. And these are two resolutions. These resolutions kind of represent that how much we appreciated their help. And you know, I'm. I'm really happy that their replacements, both Damon and Catherine, you know, I think will fulfill their shoes well and provide the same kind of guidance and expertise and 
you know, everything that, that both Mary and Diane has done as well. So I won't read the resolutions, they are on the agenda, but that will be approved as part of the omnibus uh, motion, Chuck. Yeah, and on that front, just a huge shout out to both of them. And along with Senator Pavley, I think most people realize that you're experiencing an evolution of the Wildlife Conservation Board from most of its history being a three person board to more recently in time being a, a broader board. And I think that's healthy. And uh, Diane and, and Mary helped that foundational kind of transition really be smooth and successful. So big props to them. Great. All right, and then the last item is just item 38. We'll adopt that as part of the motion as well. It just has our board meetings listed for next year. I do want to point out Thursday, we'll keep that on, but we're more than likely we're going to have to, or we will be changing the November 17th meeting. There's a potential Fish and Game Commission conflict with that particular date. So we, we will be uh, changing that date and we have not had the chance to find a new date for that, but I'll communicate that when we have it set. The rest of these are on the record now, recognizing that the board, if we have issues and need to change dates, we can, but we just wanna get these dates on everyone's calendar uh, moving forward. And then we wanna get back to morning meetings and uh, next year. Uh, so they'll, right now we'll go back to starting again at 10 o'clock in the morning uh, instead of afternoon meetings. So with that, uh, unless there's any more board member questions at this particular time, I will read the motion and then ask one of you to move it in second and then we'll vote on it. So any other, any last minute questions by board members? Hey John, just one quick thing before the motion. My, my recollection is uh, several agenda items included our issue around herbicide application. And for each of those agenda items, I would just friendly offer, we adopt in kind of the, the record, the motion here, the same standard we applied to the two in consent calendar, okay. that staff, staff will work with each of the project proponents, their experts, um, judicious application, minimization of impacts, you know, thoughtful approach, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Chuck. I appreciate that. <coughs> okay, so the motion reads, staff recommends that the wildlife conservation adopt the written findings as appropriate and approve indiv individual projects numbered 26 through 38, inclusive of the recommended funding sources and amounts as identified in the Wildlife Conservation Board final agenda meeting final meeting agenda dated November 18th, 2021. Sub subject to uh, working with and cooperating with those grantees where herbicide application would be used in any given project, uh, recognizing that they'll work with staff to prioritize its use, uh, understand its use, and uh, apply appropriately. Is that work? Well, I think prioritize reducing its use. Yeah, prioritize reducing its use on those given projects. Authorize staff to enter into appropriate agreements necessary to accomplish these projects and authorize staff and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to proceed substantially as planned. That work? I would be glad to move approval of that, uh, Director Donnelly. Uh, I'm, you articulated you, that. I'm happy to second and just a great work to your, a great job to your team. Great, thank um, you. I just want to make sure that on those, if we're going to have a section of all the staff reports that have the herbicide and pesticide information that we're just consistent with that motion. I don't know if that's necessary here, but I would just refer to Mr. Bottoms previous motion yeah. on that to make sure it's consistent. Okay. So Chuck, you're on mute. That's a great point, Gail. Thank you. I agree. 
Great, okay. So Alina had to leave uh, Chuck Bonham. Yes. Gil Miller. Hi. Damon Nagami. Yes. Fran Pavley. Yes. Catherine Phillips. Yes. And Pete Silva. Yes. Great. Well, that concludes our agenda, folks. Uh, I just very much appreciate the dialogue and the conversation. And I think I've had plenty of notes. I'm assuming my staff has taken copious notes as well. Uh, looking forward to, to implementing these projects, but then also taking on some of the, the opportunities that you guys all pointed out for us today to um, take the board even further uh, as we continue down the work of doing conservation work in California, implementing 30 by 30 uh, and working with others to, to affect positive change in California for conservation. So just thanks to everyone. Thanks to the public for joining us today. I know I realize it was a long meeting, uh, but I think it was a great meeting. So thank you. So any last parting comments from board members? Best wishes for a happy Thanksgiving. Oh, that's and right. Thank congratulations yes. on uh, Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. On a great 2021, despite COVID, and welcome to our new board members. I look forward to 2022. And I just sure. would like to make one final comment uh, on my behalf, though I do want to thank, and Michael Beck indicated, but John Walsh, our manager of our acquisition program, uh, took a promotion and went to Cal Fire. What? So we are, we are. That's not a promotion. That's, yeah. yeah. Finding what? a replacement for John. Uh, so he's, we, he will be missed for quite a while. Uh, you know, his relationships with, you know, just the conservation community as a whole, his relationships with the departments, the state departments and the federal agencies that we work with. John just had a knack of his calmness, his ability to, to do that kind of work is, is, was great. It, you know, it assisted us all uh, in carrying out the work that we needed to do. So I'll miss John, uh, but you know, I have confidence that we'll find a replacement that'll be uh, great for the board as well. So just lastly, thanks to John for his work at WCB. And so any last parting comments? Sorry. Great. Chuck, do you want to end the meeting? We are adjourned. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving.